Good evening, everybody. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? It is Tuesday. So, um, where are you guys are here? My sweet tooth fairy, congratulations on being first. I got the medals. You just got all three right away. There you go. <laughs> um, Unhung Hero for $2 says, oh, I'm going to come. Don't come. Don't come. All right, guys. So a lot happened today. If you guys were not aware, the major bridge in Baltimore, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, got hit by a boat, or I should say a ship, leaving the port of Baltimore. You know, the Baltimore Stevedores Union and their president, Frank Sabaka, have been unavailable for comment. I know everybody likes to think, like, oh, this was a terrorist attack, or all the other nonsense you hear, like, oh, there was an explosion. It's all... A boat fucking hit a bridge. That's That's what happened, okay? And the boat was, you know, piloted and guided by pilots from Baltimore Harbor. So it's not like it's, oh, the Indians attacked the, no, nope, none of that. You know, you go, to, you go to the restaurant and they overcook your steak. That's an oopsie. When you're piloting a container ship and you strike a bridge, that's an oopsie as well. It's just the scale of like how much you're allowed to get away with. That's all that happened there. I understand people have their own theories. So uh, fire away. But I'm just telling you, it's not a, it's not any of that. Okay. It's not a big terrorist attack. It's not a symbol of our infrastructure crumbling. I mean, the bridge was, <laughs> that bridge is probably not meant to have a ship that big hitting it that fast or a period. Um, I think part of that was the problem is the ship hit the bridge itself, not just the piling. So I'm sure there were a lot of problems. This is a lot of different things failing at once. And this will be something we'll chalk up to history. So just don't worry. And then, you know, all the people on the bridge sucks to be them. So, um, Tom, how you doing? Green caps is no notification again. POV says, when will we see League of Vices win? He actually did a Maritime Monday this morning, although, Jeff, it wasn't Monday, so you kind of lied. And you're also farther ahead than us, so it was already Tuesday afternoon when you did it, Tuesday evening. So it was almost Maritime Wednesday, Jeff. You've got, you've got some explaining to do there, man. But he did quite a bit. He did quite a bit explaining what's going on, how this is going to get worked on. And, yeah, I, ultimately, I think it's just going to be the pilots fucked up. You know, there's a bit of an oopsie-poopsie, and... It's a big freaking oopsie, guys. So I don't know what else you got to Nothing else to say about it. Um, Tom says they are hiding the chili jail. Hmm. I'm not sure what you're getting at there. Any P. Diddy updates? Not that I'm aware of. No big updates. So that's... Coast Guard's out looking for survivors. Of course, there, there's only so much they're going to be able to do. There's only so much they're going to be able to do. Um, here. Good ideas. So, they had a mayday call. They lost power. Yeah. Yes. They did. Yes. Diddy did this to distract everything. Yes. Yes, I did watch the video. If you guys have not seen the video, there is some footage out there. We can watch it real quick. It is the... I'll give people a couple minutes to get in here. It's the bridge getting hit in slow motion. Or, I mean, it's the bridge getting hit in sped up time timing. So, let me see here. We can find it. Uh, do, 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 do. Hold on here. All right, wait. I uh, yeah. Hold on here. Let me see if we can get this footage of it because I mean the bridge got hit. That's I. I don't know. There's not a whole lot of expert analysis needed, guys. It gets hit and. Psh, Now, let me see here. Where's the... Uh, 
So there are, let's see, there are some pictures if you guys have not seen them. Like so, here are some of these pictures. This is from the side. This is one of the pictures. This is a picture of it. And it's it's a, it's run by Marisk Shipping Line. It is an Indian, I believe it's an Indian, it's a Singapore flag vessel with an Indian crew. But yeah, there you go. It definitely, like, it knocked the whole thing over. It went boom. There's the bridge as it all went in the water. And there's another shot of it. Uh, I'm going to try to grab a, see if I can find a cut, the footage. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. All right, so there is footage of this thing going down. And then there's, where is this footage of the, uh, okay. So here is the, here's this thing happening at full speed. Um, they yeah, obviously the boats only go so fast. So it's just like Austin powers. You're like, stop as the boat, as the steamroller comes towards you. So they had to do this at speed. And, uh, here is the footage of it hitting full power. So here you go. The boat was not going this fast, by the way, Chad. It would be going a lot slower. Now, it didn't collapse that fast. It did not collapse that fast. It actually collapsed a little bit slower than that. The actual speed of it collapsing is this right here. Here's the actual speed of it collapsing in real time. It doesn't really matter, I guess, if you're stuck on the bridge, how fast that goes down. Just causes a DEI captain. The captain's, I'm pretty sure the captain was an Indian guy. But the harbor pilots were from America. So, yeah, it, it doesn't work that way, guys. It doesn't work that way. I, You know, we want to say DEI everything, sure. But these were American harbor pilots. So it's their fault the boat hit something. I mean, they're the ones in charge of navigating the ship through the harbor. When drifting goes wrong, yeah. So Karen says the captain was Ukrainian. Hmm. I don't know if I've heard all that information, so. Bifront says that bridge was huge, yeah. Yeah, and there there was a maintenance crew on the uh supposedly there might have been a maintenance crew on the bridge, like a bunch of people aren't accounted for. So that'll be an issue. As far as the bridge being huge, yeah, the Francis Scott Key Bridge is a massive bridge. I mean, it is. I love how the Wikipedia already says was. Um, it was the third longest span of any continuous truss bridge in the world. So it, it it's definitely high up there. It was. And there are multiple bridges that they talk about. I mean, like, if you guys don't understand how big of a bridge this thing was, it was a big old bridge. So, yeah, it's it's not the longest bridge in the world with the main span. That's the Ikutsuki Bridge. And then there's one out in... out in Astoria, Oregon. Then there was a Francis Scott Key Bridge. Then if you happen to live in Jacksonville, Florida, you have a very big bridge. Then there's a bunch of other ones, like the bridge that connects Cincinnati, Ohio, to Newport, Kentucky. That's a big bridge. You know, we, we build a lot of big bridges in America. So if you notice, these are all, most of these are in America or Japan. 
So we have tons of them. We have tons of bridges. So that's not really... Should be too... You know, the main span was 1,200 feet, and it was open in 1977. And who's messaging me right now? So this bridge was built, it was, it was, I, I mean, big emphasis on was, was built, um, it was first known as the Outer Harbor Crossing until 1976, that it was renamed the Key Bridge or the Beltway Bridge. It's the second longest bridge after the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, which if that was, that's a bigger, you know, that's a far more, I'd argue, prestigious bridge to get destroyed. And that that's a cool bridge. If you guys have ever been on that, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, this thing is this is a pretty neat bridge to take a to drive across. It goes all the way across the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's pretty neat. Very high up. Very very high up. So it'll it's a long way down once you get to the top, and it's actually really cool because when you go on that bridge, one lane one set one spans three lanes, the other one's two lanes, and depending on the time of uh, year. Um, from week, day to day during the week, they will open up the uh, three span, um, the three lane span. They will have traffic going the other direction to get like more flow to the beach on the Delaware coast or more flow back from the beach, depending on the time of uh, the week. It's actually kind of neat. Been on it a couple of times. So let's see anything else about it. It was. Oh, the toll rate's four dollars. Jeez. No, wow, that's a lot of money. Jeez, that's a four dollars across the bridge. But it, it it's very long, guys. It's it's total length is eight thousand feet, and it's going across Baltimore Harbor. So, when you think about it, this is Baltimore's harbor. If you guys didn't realize that, Baltimore is in the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. So that is the issue there. And this is the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, the one I was telling you about. That's really cool. And then Annapolis is the state capital. It's also where the Naval Academy is. Baltimore has all the ports. And yes, just like they talk about in the wire, the ports are all throughout the harbor. This is all Baltimore Harbor. Okay, this whole thing is pretty much Baltimore Harbor. And this is gone now. So this entire harbor is basically unusable right now this is like sinking a ship in a harbor they you know, there's nothing you can do until you dismantle it so the entire harbor is worthless but if you guys weren't aware where baltimore is that's where it is in relationship to maryland so we'll find out something soon i don't know what we're gonna find out it's cheaper if you take the train West Coast says, you know, you're shitting me. You know what the tolls are around New York City? I know. I know. Fuck, it was like two years ago. I had to go there for a funeral. And I put my Easy Pass in the window, so I didn't bother. But goddamn, just driving from getting into New Jersey and trying to drive onto Staten Island, that was, I, God, I about took your damn scalp off getting in there. So that's, uh, yeah, it's $7 across the Bay Bridge. Yep. And then... It's cheaper if you take the train. Yeah, Joe Biden takes the train across that bridge. Even though there's no trains. Yes, yeah, so the Chesapeake Bay Bridge tunnels of Virginia Beach. Yep, and that one's really cool too because you're on a bridge that goes then into a tunnel underwater that comes up on a bridge. It's actually kind of neat. Yeah, Ziggy Sabaka did it. I doxed your house on that map. Yes. I'm sure. I'm sure I did. Israel was 100% behind this. And I don't think they were. You felt safer in Iraq than you did Baltimore. That doesn't surprise me. Look at the my last comment I tagged you in. You tagged me in. I thought I answered it. Yes, it's cheaper if I take the train. Yes, I saw that. 
Oh, I didn't hear Baltimore's mayor request stop showing clips of the movie scene. Oh, no. Well, I guess, uh... Oh, well. Oh, well. Insane man says, what's the bridge where scrap rise? Scrap wise, that's hilarious. There's going to be all kinds of, uh... Bubbles and all those guys are going to come out there with their little shopping carts swimming out there trying to cut little pieces of the bridge apart for scrap. That'll just be. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Time to get started, though. We are going to get started with day two of the death penalty mitigation phase for Stephen Lorenzo, our resident local experienced and uh, bonded and insured bondage master. So. Yes, Diddy trafficked all the slaves. He's hiding the evidence. So, if you guys remember, he is basically challenging the idea that he did. He killed the guys his own way, not the way the state's saying. So remember, he's basically arguing, "I only stabbed the guy nine times, not a hundred. So, um, let's get to day two and let's see what happens from there. I know, don't apologize. I'm giving you a hard time. I didn't even realize that Mr. Gonzalez wasn't here, so uh, it's not a problem. He's here now. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I think everyone is here, in, uh, including Mr. Lorenzo. Mr. Lorenzo, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Mr. Gonzalez, good morning. You're standing. So I am, Judge. I just wanted, wanted the court for the record to know that this morning I gave Madam Clerk a redacted copy oh, of the defendant's exhibit number one. Okay. Took the original back and gave it to Mr. Uh, Lorenzo. Excellent. So I want the court to know that that's done and the uh, the exhibit is now in order. I, I, I greatly appreciate that, Mr. Gonzalez. Does the state have an opportunity to review the redacted version? I have. Uh oh. Man. I, I, we, looked, we looked at it yesterday. We looked at it this Okay. All right. So that is now the exhibit that is defense exhibit number one. Um, let me just make sure also, I know we admitted two defense exhibits. Were those, were, was it only two or did I miss any defense exhibits yesterday? Only two, Judge, and, and the other exhibit was entered as, as it should have been. Right, as no redactions. Right, right. And, and it's not over. Um, Mr. Lorenzo hasn't even gotten to his case in chief, so he certainly will have the opportunity. I think we had discussed that there were some additional things that he may want to uh, introduce or attempt to introduce. There's that 20 page, so we'll, uh, that, that's not, or no, is that one of the exhibits that was admitted? Yeah, it is, Judge. Oh, okay, all right, then I apologize. Um, but still, he'll have the opportunity if there's anything else he wants to seek to admit. Um, Mr. Diaz, uh, good morning. Uh, Madam State Attorney Lopez, good morning. Good morning and good morning. And Mr. Dirks, good morning. Um, Mr. Diaz, you're standing. Does that mean you have something that you want to say? Just want to give the court a roadmap. We're going to read in the testimony of the five prior victims that we already admitted the transcripts of. We have our people here to serve as those witnesses effectively, and then we'll be putting on the two mothers. All right, excellent. So we'll start that way. I know that when we do it in front of a jury, there's an instruction or something, but I do not need the benefit of that instruction. I understand the law and uh, this. Um, is over your objection, Mr. Lorenzo. The, so that is preserved for the record. But yes, what do you? What would you like to say at this time? Um, the state never actually put the legalities of why these people are unavailable. 
I asked that at one time, and it was never it got run over. It kind of got lost. They never actually said why these people are unavailable to come in here. Um, we talked about other things. That we're I know, yeah, but it's come up. <coughs> Mr. Diaz. Uh, yes, John. Uh, the Florida Evidence Code actually contains two provisions where former testimony may be used. One is the hearsay exception, even when the declarant is available. But as a general rule, that is not usable by the prosecution in a criminal case. The other is when the declarant is unavailable. That is another potential option by which hearsay testimony could be admissible. However, uh, hearsay does not govern this particular proceeding as we're in a penalty phase. 921.141 governs instead, and it's clear that hearsay is admissible as long as the defendant has a meaningful chance to rebut whatever claims there are. As we stated before, Mr. Lorenzo had counsel in a full-blown trial in federal court. They had every opportunity to confront those witnesses, and so the testimony is the testimony, and we believe that it is admissible under 921.141. All right, so, and, and I, I thought we had discussed that, or maybe it was research that we had done, I discussed with my staff attorney, but you were not seeking to admit it on the basis that any of those people who testified in the federal trial who you intend to read transcripts of today are in fact unavailable at this time. Is that correct? No, I don't want to speak to each individual one because I didn't do the work. I know that some of them I think we had trouble locating or getting here, but... We but that's not the basis that's not of the basis, your... No. Right. Okay, that's what I wanted to Okay, not a right. problem. Right. And, and I, I guess... Just for, for the court's edification and for Mr. Lorenzo, we attempted to get all of them back. We discovered that two are deceased, that, that one is, is unlocatable in Spain, Another one lives in California that, that, that we could not locate. Another one lives in Indiana that we just could not get any response from and could not locate. So we wanted to bring all of them back. We, we got everyone we could. Well, I appreciate that. I'm not making a finding that they're unavailable because that's not, I, I would need more than those representations regarding their current status, uh, death certificates for those who uh, may be deceased. But um, apparently it's not necessary, and I agree uh, with you, Mr. Diaz, um, and Mr. Lorenzo, um, it is hearsay, but hearsay is admissible in this type of proceeding. This is not the guilt phase, um, and it is a penalty phase. It will ultimately go to what weight I give the evidence, and you certainly can argue to me um, to give it less weight because, um, for whatever reason, right. but ultimately go to the weight I give it. It's admissible, but um, what weight I ultimately give it would be for me to decide. Okay. Thank you. I do have, is there anything else, um, Mr. Lorendo, before we get started today? No, I don't think so. We've got to bring, they're bringing the Mother's Day, right? We've got to be able to do the, everything together. I think that that's what Mr. Diaz indicated after the reading. We'll see how long that takes. But you have two live witnesses left who are the mothers of the two victims in this case. Yes, and even after yesterday's conversation, I've had a specific, I'm doing Ruth Wackles, for example. I'm going to do, tell me about your son, tell me about the loss to you and your family, and then I will do the, what do you want to tell the judge, to sort of clearly demarcate what I think would have been penalty phase testimony and what would have been Spencer here testimony. I appreciate that. Um, and Mr. Lorenzo, we discussed that yesterday. Have you had any change of heart on allowing them to testify as to both of those things when they testify? No, the mothers have waited 20 years to say that piece. So I think they've waited more. All right, I, I appreciate that. And I have something to say in light of uh, kind of that's a perfect segue that they've waited 20 years. And it's something that I'm currently doing research on. I'm thinking out loud here. I want to throw it out there. And it may require also something that I think <clears throat> I'm still missing from the state. Normally, at the conclusion of the penalty phase proceedings where the state and the defense presents their um, evidence and testimony, the jury would be instructed and they would go out and they would deliberate and return a, 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 a verdict of, uh, on the sentence of life or death. So I really don't know why I am the jury in this case. I really don't know what would prohibit me. I know that they're, you know, and we're trying to comply with a lot of very important case law from the Florida Supreme Court, particularly when mitigation is waived by the defendant and the court has an obligation to seek whatever mitigation may be out there and to weigh it. And which, what brings me to, there was a mitigation notice filed by Mr. Lorenzo on um, December 14th of 2021, which has a, a significant amount of stuff, you know, programs that he's completed, um, a number of things, which I intend to consider as, as mitigation. But in it, there's a reference to a mitigation packet that was submitted to the state in March of 2020. I think the state has an obligation, as we've discussed before, where I requested the sentencing um, uh, transcript from federal court, which I have, but I would like or, or like to hear why the state should not provide to me, and I would like it as soon as possible, the mitigation packet that was submitted. I, I recall that. I think Mr. Gonzalez prepared that. That's true. That would be correct. That's true. And it's now in the possession of the state. Why wouldn't? Why shouldn't? Under the case law, where it says the state has an obligation to present to me any possible mitigation when the defendant waives mitigation, 
and you have a mitigation packet prepared by standby counsel, why shouldn't I have that in my hands before I make a determination and weigh aggravators and mitigators? Well, if Your Honor will indulge me, does Mr. Gonzalez still have that mitigation packet that he can just provide the copy? Except that the, the case law says that the state has to provide it. I just don't want... Can Mr. Gonzalez provide me a copy? That also becomes an issue of that attorney is unauthorized to provide documents to the court because he's standby counsel. I mean, he has to give it to the state and then the state could do something with it. But yeah, I'd argue, you know, if I'm if I'm Lorenzo, I'd argue hybrid representation at that point. You can't give it to him. So, yeah, I, I don't understand why the state just won't offer the shit they're supposed to. Again, so I don't have to go digging through the nine boxes to try to find it. That may work. It, it's a large, That'll work. It's a large three ring binder. The problem is, Mr. Lorenzo has instructed me not to provide anything to the state. Then it needs to come from the state. <clears throat> well, Your Honor, we will attempt to find it. I don't know where that thing is at the moment to tell you that I could say I know exactly. It was a large three ring binder. You want me to come over to your office and look for a large three ring binder? No, Your Honor. Obviously, we will under, we will undertake the effort. I appreciate that. At the moment, I can't tell you that I, I know where it is. All right, but, Mr. Durst is on his way. All right, I appreciate that. Um, so I think it's something I need in my hands. And what I'm telling you all is that at the conclusion of these proceedings, which I suspect may actually conclude today, I want each side to be prepared, instead of writing a, uh, a, a memorandum uh, that is the normal procedure. But again, the normal procedure is not necessarily applicable here because I don't have a jury, to be prepared to give some summary of an argument, closing argument, like you would do to a jury, because I'm the jury. I appreciate that. And Ms. Lorenzo, you would do the same. But I also have some questions for you, because it's your rights that I am concerned about, your due process rights and all of that. What I'm suggesting is then I will deliberate. If we go that route, I will deliberate. We were scheduled for all week, um, but I will have a number of things, including hopefully the three ring binder to consider mitigation, and then we will come back to court tomorrow, and I will deliver my, my decision after thorough deliberation and consideration of aggravators, mitigators, and the weighing of those, which is the most important thing. What the Supreme Court requires that I do before I can consider um, delivering a sentence of death. So my question ultimately, um, it's my understanding also that we have not received, and when reading the, the sentencing transcript uh, that was provided, it is not the full sentencing transcript from the federal proceeding. So we would like to have that as well. There's references to other things in the transcript that we have that were related to the sentencing. So if, in fact, that's correct, we would also like to get that sometime today so that I can consider that in any deliberations that I make um, tonight and through into the morning and tomorrow morning before I render a decision. But let me go back to you, Mr. Lorenzo. Mr. Lorenzo, you've heard um, what I've proposed, and I want to make sure that you don't have any reservations with that at all. If you do, then I will absolutely not hesitate to go ahead and have each side submit. I'll give you 45 days to submit a sentencing memorandum, which is normally how we proceed. And we normally only proceed that way if a jury, after deliberating, reaches a conclusion of death sentence. Then there's the opportunity for me, and then that's where we have um, the, the other hearing, and I consider the memorandums before I make a decision. As I've said, since you have removed the jury with my permission, after a thorough uh, colloquy with you, I think that we can go this way without running afoul of the Florida Supreme Court. But before I even consider, well, I am considering it, but before I would do that, I would want your um, input and to hear if you have any reservations or if you are all right with that. Technically, I would rather to wait so I can see what the state puts on paper. That's what I would prefer to see, go ahead and see what their memorandum has to say. Well, let me, and, and just uh, this, uh, their memorandum, would they would substitute a closing argument today right. that would essentially be um for my purposes their memorandum so once all the evidence is closed and you have the opportunity i would turn to them and they're going to make their final argument to me which you'll have the opportunity to listen to and then you'll have the opportunity to make your final argument which is any thoughts that you may have and any responses to what they've presented right. so we're doing it orally as opposed to having a written uh document that would be submitted in 45 days so i just want to make sure you understand all of that in making your decision. Right. I'd rather to stay to 45 days. That's what I prefer. But if it's going to make it easier for the court, no, 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 <laughs> no. Um, no. I, I tell you me. what. I tell you what. I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. It's only something that I was considering and thinking around. I'm going to ask you to consider think, to, to just 
to continue considering it. Because I really put you on the spot by just throwing that out there and asking you for an answer, and I apologize for that. Right. So I want you to continue to think about it. That's not a decision that we will need to have until the end of today, once the state is printed and that. So you think about it. If you want to talk to standby counsel about it, if you have any questions of me about it, I'm happy to do that before we get to your final decision. Is that all right with you? That works here. Yes. All right, excellent. Yes. And in the meantime, the state is going to work on those documents that if, in fact, Mr. Lorenzo agrees, that I would need to consider tonight um, to weigh as potential mitigation. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. All right, so, Mr. Diaz, are we ready to proceed? Yes, sir. I will be handling the next portion, but just if I could very briefly, I'd like to submit to Evan State Exhibit Number 9. This is a certified copy of conviction for Mr. Lorenzo's 10 counts for which he was found guilty in federal court. Uh, shown them to the defense. I don't right. they have any legal objection? Not at all. No. All right. Um, it'll be admitted in state 10, you said? Yes, sir. But nine. 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 I'm sorry. State 10 is the fly. And that's already been admitted. That was admitted yesterday. All right. So now we have state 9 admitted. Yes, sir. I would say call your first witness, but I think you're going to have people come down and read from the transcript. Who is, what is the name of the uh, first transcript? Uh, I'll look forward to my co-counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. This is State, uh, this is state Attorney Kevin Riley for the record. The first witness, Your Honor, will be Stephen Leach, or excuse me, Joseph Leach. So he is um, actually uh, C in State A. H C is the transcript, and someone is going to come down. The funny part is Lorenzo's all about role play, so he's like, I love, I love the reenactment. And read Mr. Leach's portion. That'll be ASA Sean Crow, uh, right behind me, Your Honor. All right, if you'll come on down, there's no need to swear you in. So, Your Honor, I will be being the prosecutor, Mr. Porcelli, and then additionally, I'll be the defense attorney, Mr. Harrison, um, and then Mr. Crenshaw will be Mr. Lynch. All right, welcome, Mr. Crenshaw. Um, as I said, normally there is a reconstruction that I would read to the jury, but uh, since I'm... Do you guys want to listen to this part, or do you want me to try to skip ahead a little bit? Because them reading all this nonsense in, they're literally reading in testimony these guys gave somewhere else, and probably similar to what we heard these guys give test not all of them were there who have testified so far but a couple of those guys have testified to things that have happened to them so do you guys want to hear this part oh yeah brandon he's already he's already toast yeah we're gonna skip we'll skip okay so let's the see jury i don't believe that that's necessary and i will just turn it over to you mr riley thank you honor good morning mr lake good morning if you can pull the microphone a little closer to you sir how old are you 26 years old if you can talk a little louder as well 26 years old. Where do you currently reside? 3010 San Carlos Street. Is Which has been previously about the... It wasn't for a movie? No, it wasn't for a movie. No further questions. The court. Redirect Mr. Roselli. Mr. Roselli. No, Your Honor. The court. Thank you, Mr. Alvin. You, you're excused to go. You may step down. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. I think my, my court report probably needs a break. That transcript was uh, 29 pages. The remaining two are each 32 pages. So just for uh, timing, what I suspect we'll do, we'll take a 15-minute break. We'll come back. We'll do, if it's the uh, state's intention, to do the last two readings. And as I said, each of them are 32 pages. We'll see what time it is then and make a determination whether we'll do an early lunch and come back and do the live witnesses after or start the live witnesses. What I may ask the state is um, how much time you anticipate spending with them before I make that decision. Uh, should I ask about the bind, the, the, the search or the location of the three wing binder? Cool. Judge, the, um, a, um, like a 25 page, I'll refer you Yeah, to well, that's then I want to just get Mr. Gonzalez to verify he's not in his head. That's the mitigation packet that you submitted? It is, Judge. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it, it, came in a, it came in a binder, but obviously. Because yeah. I don't need the binder. Yeah. That's yeah, no, I just want to make sure I have whatever was submitted as uh, a mitigation. My recollection is, I remember discussing this, this is when the state was going to the homicide committee. There were negotiations regarding having um, Mr. Lorenzo plead to life, um, and the presentation was going to be made to the homicide So, guys, we are skipping ahead through lunch. We're getting through all that nonsense. And now we're going to get to, like, the... Uh, the moms of the two guys he killed. So here we go. Yes, Your Honor, just very briefly before that, uh, Your Honor may recall that at uh, the December 2nd, uh, sorry, December 6th, 2022 hearing, where Your Honor accepted Mr. Lorenzo's plea, the state of Florida filed a packet which is marked composite number one, which was one to four pages of a typed document. Actual um, uh, basis, I believe. Right, and then there were three pictures that are attached. Um, in order to avoid any confusion, because it is already part of the record officially through the clerk's office, as composite number one, 
I'm simply asking that Your Honor take judicial notice of that for purposes of this hearing so it can be referred to as needed in any written arguments that may come. So I'm asking you to take judicial notice of composite number one, which is four page type document and three pictures marked A, B, and C as part of that composite. Mr. Lorenzo, did you have the opportunity to look at that composite and do it? Uh, yeah. Send that to me, please. Yes, I've, I've seen that. Yes, before you. Do you have the objection to the court taking judicial notice of it? At we'll go over that after this is over. At this time? No, not at all. All right. All right, this time the state would call Ruth Wackel. Ms. Wackel. Ms. Wackel, good afternoon and welcome, man. You, ma'am, you take your time getting up to the stand that, that is a ramp so please be careful and watch your step you're welcome check the microphone yes. that on I apologize for all that, but you make yourself as comfortable as you can. That microphone in front of you, the bass moves, and then the stem of the microphone moves up and down. Okay. So you get as comfortable as you can. You let me know. Okay. I think we have a bit consistent uh, sit. You want to sit up here? Okay. Would you like for her to sit behind you, ma'am? If she... Okay. Well, I don't know if she's going to fit next to you. Okay. But we can have her that's right good. there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's perfect. All right. Um, I do need to swear you in, ma'am. So okay. you can remain seated, but raise your right hand, please. Thank okay. you. Do you swear or affirm any testimony you give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, I do. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Diaz, you may proceed. Thank you, ma'am. If you would, please state your full legal name and spell your last name for the record. Who's Ellen Wackles? Uh oh. Uh oh. What is that? <coughs> That's not you, ma'am. Don't worry about it. It's one of our many um, audio. Things. Mr. Diaz, was that you? I, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> cameraman raised his hand. We, we got that uh, taken care of? All right, I get, I'm getting a thumbs up, so you can proceed. Thank you, Ma'am, if you were, I'm sorry, you said Ruth Ellen Wachholz, if you could please spell your last name for the record. W-A-C-H-H-O-L-T-Z. -H -H Thank you, ma'am. Are you the mother of Michael Wachholz? Yes, I am. And how, when was he born? It, uh, he was born on 26 October, 1977. All right, and so, as of uh, December of 2003, he would have been how old? 26. 26. Uh, I want to talk with you about your family. Is Michael your only son? No, I have another son, 10 months younger. And what's his name? Stephen Walker. All right. And uh, we are here today for you to give his honor a, a peek into who your son was as a person, to talk yes, about you know, his character as a person, and then to also tell us about how all of this has impacted you and your family. Did you come today with a pre-prepared statement? Yes, I have. All right, well, we're going to get to that in one second, but just real quick. Um, Your Honor, I have a pair of pictures that I'm only going to use as demonstratives. These are the originals. I don't want to take them from this. I understand. Place. So, ma'am, I'm going to put a picture up on the screen right there to your side. Is this your son, Michael? The one looking to the side is Michael. Yeah, the one is my son, Stephen. So this one, this one is Stephen? Yes. And Michael? Yes. Okay. They were like twins. <laughs> and then, is this also your son, Michael? Yes. That's uh, who Michael was. Just love, funny, just love life. And uh, I'm going to take a guess. He's literally somewhere in the middle of the air skydiving in the moment of this picture? <laughs> yes, he was. All right. That was the year he was killed. Well, please take your time, but if you would, I know that you brought a pre-prepared statement. If you would read it, um, yes. now would be a time to do so. Okay. Michael, what can I say? He was my firstborn, light of my life, such a good kid. Michael was such a good kid, hands down. He wasn't perfect, but oh, did he have heart. He was a friend to all. I even met someone at the airport in TSA department in Tampa 20 years ago that Michael had waited on. He worked at a, um, oh, what was it called, that restaurant? <laughs> uh, Olive Garden, I'm sorry. Olive Garden, that Michael loved him. them. They said what a fantastic person he was. He was such an outgoing, friendly person. Everybody he met was a friend. He just had that extra something. After being in the Army and all of a sudden, Mom decided to move on a farm and milk cows for some reason. 
It was quite an adjustment for him. <laughs> I had no clue what I was doing, having never milked cows before. We wired up a building, plumbed a barn, and installed milking equipment. But between the two of us, we did it. He would shake his head at me and say, are you sure, Mom? And I would say, I don't know, but we'll find out. And that's how we worked. After he moved to Florida, it was hard because he was so much further away. We still talked on the phone, but to see each other was so hard. It was very difficult to be able to come down, well, come up to Florida, come up to Missouri, sorry. Right. He came and spent a month on the farm, and man, that was so cool. I really missed him. I really missed him. There's no way he should have been killed. He had so many nieces and nephews that thought a lot of him. We spent a, month, a bunch of time, of my leave time, in Wisconsin when the kids were younger. And then when I was medically retired, I bought the farm. Literally bought the farm. And they would come down. Everyone loved Michael. He was such a cool kid, and he turned into a fine young man. Michael's brother is only 10 months younger, and it was like he had lost a twin. It affects him to this day in how he does things. My whole family has a hole that will never be closed. That includes me too. <laughs> when I think of Michael, which is every day, I think of him skydiving with such joy on his face, which is how he faced life. He had such joy on his face. Snuffed out, but not forgotten. And when I think of the fact that he was gone he actually has gone home, and he'll be there waiting in the palms of God's hands, just waiting for me. All right, ma'am, I know it's been a, a long time coming, but we are, are finally here. Um, I'm sure that you've had a lot that you probably want to say to the judge and you want the judge to hear. Um, I want to turn the floor over to you, as it were, so you can tell the judge what you think could happen in this case and, and what you feel about it. I really do. <laughs> okay. Take your time. Go ahead. Would you like some water, ma'am? Eva, can we get her a glass I of water? water? Yes, oh, you, you ha yeah, we're I have butter. Oh, you have some? <laughs> yeah, I forgot it. Well, we're gonna get you. We're gonna get you a cup, or if you uh, if you have water in the courtroom, yeah. we're we're happy to get that. But Eva, the bailiff is getting you a cup of water from the jury room. Okay. They have bottled water back there. Yeah. That's so. Yeah. Take this, and then she's gonna bring you what's in a cup. So if you want to then um, pour your bottle into the cup, you're welcome okay. to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. You take your time, ma'am. Thank you. I'll take some time. An eye for an eye. It would be nice if we could have old time justice hanging. Have him watch the gallows being built. Firing squad, not blindfolded. Guillotine, again, not blindfolded. What he did to my son before murdering him should be done to him. Eye for an eye. Unfortunately, our modern justice is not like that. and allows people to sleep, eat, play, have shelter, and be clothed for free. Even after the events of this week, it will continue for a time. He should no longer breathe. My son doesn't, so why should he? He is lower than a snake that crawls on the ground, and if found, it should get his head chopped off. At least where I'm from, it should. For 20 years, he's breathed and lived, and Michael hasn't at taxpayer's expense, no less. It's time to end this. It's time. That's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Diaz, do you have any additional questions of No, Ms. Walks, I just want to make sure, is there anything else you want to say? This is your opportunity. It's time to end this. Thank you, ma'am. I understand, I appreciate that the procedures allow for the defendant and or his counsel, if he had counsel, to ask you questions at, that, at this time if he wishes. So I'm simply going to inquire with him now. Mr. Lorenzo, do you have any questions of this witness? 
Hello, Ms. Buckles. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, thank you for your time. Mr. Diaz, did you have anything else with this witness? No, Your Honor, thank you. Ms. Waffles, I thank you. I uh, allow you to step down now. Please watch your step. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I mean, that was, I mean, you know, her, her initial written down stuff I thought was very nice. And even when she got the chance to say what she needed to say, uh, I thought that was very, very, very well uh, and poignant. Not even swearing or screaming or yelling at, you know, that, that was very... She's had a lot of time to think about what she'd like to say. You could tell. 20 some odd years in the making. You can use that railing. I'm surprised he had nothing to say to her. Mr. Diaz, I'll ask the state to please call your next witness. Uh, the state calls Pam Williams and Ms. Lopez at the end. Ms. Williams, good afternoon and welcome. Please watch your step. I'm going to let you go ahead and get seated and then I'll swear you in. Okay. Take your time. This, this seat here. Um, try to make yourself as comfortable as possible. I see you have some water, but if at any time you need anything from us, I can get you a cup of water from the jury room. Okay. All right. You let me know when you're comfortable. That microphone in front of you is adjustable. You might need to swing it down a little bit. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Yes. All right. I do need to swear you in. If you raise your right hand, please. Do you swear any testimony you give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you, ma'am. You may proceed. You ready, Ms. Williams? Ms. Williams, will you please state your full name for the court? Pamela Williams. Okay. Ms. Williams, if you could just raise your voice a little bit because I want to make sure that we all hear you, okay? Got it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ms. Williams, are you the mother of Jason Gale House? Yes, I am. Okay. When was Jason born? November 14, 1977. How old was Jason at the time that he died? 26. Do you have any other children or extended family? No, I do not. He was my only one. You were sitting here when Mr. Diaz was talking to Ms. Wachholz, and I'm going to ask you the same questions. I would like to get to know and, and for you to let the judge know what kind of a person Jason was and how it was that he affected your life. And we'll get to more questions like you heard with Ms. Wachholz in a few minutes, okay? He was sweet, kind. He had a good personality. Everybody liked him. When he went, went in a room, he just lit up the room because he had that charisma about him. He had a beautiful singing voice that got cut short. And he worked hard. He got his own student loans. He came up here for the second semester to do interior design. That never happened. And he just was a wonderful person. And it affected everybody, his friends, me, my family. It's, it was just a horrible thing. Where did Jason go to school? He went to school down in Sarasota. Okay. And one of them was the Ringling Arts. And then when he was in, in Tampa, where did he go to school? I don't know the name of the college up here. Okay, but he was in his second semester? He, he just signed up for it two nights before he was killed. And did he have a job as well? Yes, he worked at Jenny's Forest up here. He's an interior designer of the flowers. Okay. And also in Sarasota. Okay. Um, Ms. Williams, you traveled a very, very long road to get here. Yes, I did. And... 
what would what is it that you would like to first tell Judge Sabella? I want that man to get the death penalty penalty and nothing less. Period. Ms. Williams, is there anything else that you would like for Mr. Lorenzo or anyone in this courtroom to know? Yes, I do. I want to tell him. I look straight at you. You are the scumbag of the earth, and I cannot believe how you can sit there with no remorse, no I'm sorry, no nothing. I only have a grave. I only have a tombstone. All I got is ground up hamburger meat in the ground because of you, you scumbag. That's exactly what you are. You're the dirt underneath my fingernails. And you do not deserve to be living today and even tomorrow. You should be dead already as far as I'm concerned. You put me through holy hell. Not only that, my health, because now I've got stage four breast cancer. I'm not saying that you caused all of it, but you caused plenty of it with emotional strain on me and my family and his friends. And I can tell you right now, I am sick of my stomach just to have to look at your disgusting face. Yeah, that's right. Make a face, you creep, because that's what you are. And I had to wait 20 friggin' years to come up here and tell you what I think of you, and I'm going to say what I have to say. And a couple of things were sticking in my crop, and one of them was when you and that other creep said, oh, we'll make the bodies disappear and make the family suffer. Do you understand me? Make the families suffer. And the other thing that's sticking in my crop was after you cut him up, you went around and threw his parts in garbage bags and dumpsters and all over the city, and you pulled away and you laughed about it. Laughed! What the hell is wrong with you? You are a sick person, and I wish to God somebody would cut you up in pieces, because that's what you deserve. So now you know how I feel about you. Ms. Williams, is there anything else that you would like for the court to know? The closer he goes and gets the death penalty, the happier I'll be. Yes, ma'am. Anything else, ma'am? My last words to you, from one Italian to the other, ciao, ciao, born a Latino. Do you know what that means? Goodbye, good luck. And this mother's out to get her revenge. Ms. Williams, um, I, before you get up, yep. Um, the Judge Sabella is going to, to instruct you that Mr. Lorenzo will have a chance to uh, ask you questions if he would like to. Mr. Okay? Lorenzo, Thank do you. you have any questions of this uh, witness? Mr. Lorenzo, I'll just good luck to you. Yeah. Have a good one. You may step down, ma'am. Thank you. Please watch your step. I'm actually inclined to agree this is what he wanted. He... Like, he's got a little bit of a humiliation fetish. He wants to see everybody get angry and mad, big mad, roar. Like, he wants that. I, I do think he does want that. I think it's a very astute observation. And I, this is very much what he wanted. So. Base Manicotti. Yeah. She doesn't approve of Olive Garden. Hmm. He's smart enough to be on the other side of the contract. Well, I think there's a little bit of issue of uh, what was the true scope of risk there. I don't think it was fair. She has, oh, she's got a right to be angry. She does. But I'm surprised he didn't, not, not even a peep out him at all. I'm sure when the state has more things they're going to do or he's going to offer things, I'm sure there'll be peeps out of him then. So let's keep going. Diaz, you're standing, so I suspect that uh, I should turn to you at this point. Yes, sir. That concludes the state's presentation. Stay with us. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. Diaz, Madam State Attorney Lopez, <coughs> and Mr. Dirks. I'll now turn to you at this time, uh, Mr. Lorenzo, and this is your opportunity to present anything that you wish to present in this proceeding. We've had some discussions throughout, some times where with witnesses on the stand, you appeared to want to offer testimony, 
and I told you that that was not the time for it. That was the time to ask questions okay. of the witnesses that the state had presented and that you would have the opportunity during your case in chief to do that. I also mentioned several times that this is the opportunity that you have any additional witnesses or exhibits that you want to present and have the state or have the court consider uh, in this case. So I'm going to go through a couple of those things with you now because we've now turned to you now that the state has rested. First, are there any other exhibits, any evidence that you seek to admit at this time? Uh, no, not at all. You were able to um, introduce a couple of items. I believe, um, Madam Clerk, what was the total number of exhi defense exhibits? The total number was, uh, was two or three, I believe. Two. Two. All right. <clears throat> Was there, you have nothing else at this time, but I just want to confirm with you that those were the two items of evidence that you wanted to have admitted. They have been admitted. You uh, acknowledge? Yes, Zupa Toscana is actually a very good soup at Olive Garden. Um, but the rest of it's just me. Is that? Yes, I do, yeah. All right. And no other items or exhibits or evidence that you seek to admit at this time. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. All right. The other thing that I typically ask at this stage before I turn to the defendant themselves and you are, and let me also, just in an abundance of caution, I know that at every stage of the proceeding, including the beginning of this proceeding, I've pointed out to you that you have standby counsel present, a very competent standby counsel who has assisted us very much and who I appreciate very much in these proceedings. Now that we have turned and it is your opportunity to present any defense case, do you still wish to represent yourself? Yes, I do. And I'll ask you again, has anyone forced you or threatened you in any way to make this decision? No. And are you under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or prescription medication today that may affect your ability to freely and voluntarily make this decision? No. All right. You do understand that Mr. Gonzalez is sitting next to you. If at any time you need to consult with him, I will allow that. If at any time you change your mind and you want him to step in and be your attorney and represent you, I will also allow that. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. Let me ask you now, do you have any other witnesses, any witnesses at all that you intend to, be, to call on your behalf in your part of the case? I uh, know. All right. So then is the time that I turn to the defendant to see if the defendant has any testimony or statements. You pled guilty in the guilt phase, so you waived a number of rights there, but you still have similar rights in this proceeding. You have the right to remain silent and not testify if you so wish. If you would like to testify, though, I will swear you in. I'll allow you to testify from there. There's a microphone at your desk. But I need to know, first of all, have you made a decision as to whether you want to testify or not? I am not going to testify. There's no need to, yeah. Okay. Has anyone forced you or threatened you in any way to make this decision? No. And our, I've already asked you, uh, that'll carry over. You've been in front of me uh, since the last time I asked you whether you were taking any medication or anything else that may affect your ability to freely and voluntarily decide. So I'm going to accept that uh, statement from you that you are not going to testify. Right. So now, technically, you would rest. So is that your intention to rest the defense portion of this proceeding? Yes, I pretty much expressed myself already. Court kind of has an idea where I'm at. So yes, the defense rests. All right. That doesn't mean that you won't have the opportunity to argue. We're going to readdress something that we discussed earlier about whether we're going to do that orally now or whether we are going to have written memorandums. So we're going to come back to that. I told you that I wanted you to talk to Mr. Gonzalez. I wanted you to think about that, and I am going to return to you on that. I see that Mr. Diaz is standing, and that's usually an indication that he wants to say something. So now that the defense has rested, Mr. Diaz, what says the state? No, I just I wanted to seek clarification from your honor. Um, I understand what the court has said. I know that your intention is to take uh, a look at and read the defendant's 147-page mitigation packet, whatever, he, I don't remember what title of mitigation uh, motion. There notice, was, mitigation notice, notice uh, mitigation. but also the mitigation packet that was put together on his behalf that I received a copy of this morning is something that I will be, I, I have an obligation to look for any mitigating um, circumstances that should be considered and weighed in this case against the aggravating factors. I understand, and I, I don't disagree with your honor at all. I just want to, I want to see clarification. At December 6th, when the defendant entered his plea, your Honor had the defendant under oath. He at that time made several statements yes, he did. regarding the facts of how the events played out. All of those statements that were made at that point in time were only as to Jason Galehouse. The 147 page motion of, or mitigation notice the defendant has filed with the court contains a variety of other facts the defendant is claiming to be true. I don't believe the defendant is under oath for any of those statements. I don't believe the defendant has filed any sort of document that would make those statements under oath. And now he's chosen not to testify. Uh, I am curious if the defendant 
is going to be asking Your Honor to consider the factual assertions as to the death, at least, of Michael Wachholz, which were never made under oath. And well, let me, let me stop you, because the last time he was in court after filing that, I had him adopt all of those. I swore him in, had him testify that he was adopting every statement in that written uh, document. He also pointed out that he indicated in the end that it was, um, he was swearing, he indicated that there was some uh, signature in the document that indicated that um, he was under oath at the time or swearing to. But I had him sitting in that box um, not long ago acknowledge, accept all of the statements in that 147 page document. And yes, I do intend to consider it. It is, it is a part of uh, the record in this case. And again, he, I went through with him thoroughly last time in court. His adoption of that, his acceptance of every word in every page of that, and told him that that was um, just as if he had said it in open court under oath. And, and I he believe he would be subject to cross-examination. I'm sorry? And I believe he would be subject to cross-examination. He would, if you'd like to cross-examine him. I, I would love to ask him about his 147-page document. I would love to ask him all about it. All right. Oh, so we are going to, oh, chat, we are going to get something good here. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Um, the death penalty is boring. It's a lethal injection, not the chair. Yeah, but that's, it's what it is now. It's what it is now. Um, Unhung Hero for $5 says it's like a mix between Sunshine Highway and Amtrak Sunset Limited. Boat causing a bridge collapse is more common than you think. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, Val is saying, what is the argument, Sean, against letting people eligible for the death penalty have their wish? Uh, I, there really isn't, there really isn't, uh, you mean for like the anti-death penalty people? Because they're, you know, you're asking for it, you're volunteering it. The state just want to make sure that it's done right. I mean, that's, that's the big issue there. And then Fat262 says it would have been great if Lawrence would have called a sovereign citizen expert on the death penalty. Yes, that would have been great. So I guess we'll get to hear Lorenzo talk. This will be interesting. So. Um, I'll allow it. I would ask you to take the witness stand as normal then. All right. Mr. Lorenzo, we're going to bring you down to the witness stand. I'm going to refuse to answer, just so you know. Which he can do. Okay, well, I'll ask my questions. He can refuse. All right. Um, let's go ahead and put you on the witness stand. on the stand so no i'm going to respectfully decline your request he does have an opportunity to consult with counsel though judge in the event that he has a question about his testimony correct Just stand by counsel cross that bridge when and if we come to yes i uh am looking at the 147 page document i just want to put the official title on the record that is defense's notice of mitigation and objections for court considerations at sentencing hearing I want to make sure that we're all on the same page that that is the document that uh, we are referencing. I have a 147 page handwritten document dated January 19th, 2023, uh, and it's signed by what appears to be Mr. Lorenzo on the last page of the 147 page document. That's, that's, that's what I have. There's just a couple of pages. There's two pages on the top, which are um, a dear madam slash sir, and then it is the third page, which says one of 147 and has the title, Defense's Notice of Mitigation and Objection for court consideration at sentencing hearing. So um, all one packet, two technically separate documents. Thank I think you. it's the 147 page document 
that you are uh, most interested in. That is correct, Your Honor. Uh, that is the one that I'm here about. All right, Mr. Lorenzo, I'm going to go ahead and uh, swear you in. We'll see what happens next. But if I can have you raise your right hand, please thank you. Do you sure. swear affirm and testimony that you may give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, sir. All right, put your hand down. Mr. Diaz, you may proceed. Hi, Mr. Lorenzo. I know that we are, you know, obviously people on different sides of the, the divide here in a courtroom, but I, I really want to try and just make sure that all of us understand what you've written in terms of your mitigation and then what you've written in terms of the facts that you allege in terms of how this all went. You started this trial by saying that what Mr. Schweiker has to say is all a lie and the state that the, the state's opening was a wonderful story, but it's all a lie. And I'm sure that we all want to make sure that the right decision is made here, and we know what decision you want that to be, but we want to make sure that we do it for the right reason. So I really want a chance to ask you about your mitigation and about the facts that you've alleged. Um, on page 35 of your motion, you begin, uh, I'm going to call it a motion, but you title it a notice, so I think that that's more correct. I'll call it a notice. On page 35, you wrote defendant's mitigation, defensive mitigation circumstances, and you listed five. Had we had a normal trial in front of a jury, there would have been a time where we would have had to select the mitigation that does or does not apply that the jury can consider. Right. Um, the first one you wrote is the defendant has no significant history of prior criminal activity. Is that correct? I'm not going to answer that. You won't answer whether or not you wrote in your own handwriting, number one, the defendant has no significant history of prior criminal activity? I'm not going to answer that. Number two says the victim was a participant in the defendant's conduct or consent, consented to the act. I'm not going to answer that. And technically, you can't keep on asking me questions when you know I'm not going to refute when I can continue to All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Lorenzo. But yes. I see the law differently than you do. I think that's why we have this adversarial process. Okay. Uh, did you write the defendant was an accomplice uh, in the capital felony committed by another person and his or her participation was relatively minor. I'm not going to answer that. And did you write the defendant acted under extreme duress or under the substantial domination of another person? I'm not going to answer that. All right, let me ask you a question. As we go to these, um, you say the defendant has no significant criminal history. Having read your motion, your assertion is basically you didn't have any prior history to 2003 because at that point you hadn't yet been convicted of the 10 offenses that are listed in number nine, correct? I'm not going to answer that. So I don't know why you keep on going. When you write the victim was a participant and the defendant, uh, in the defendant's conduct or consented to the act, does that account for the fact that you admitted in the motion that you drugged Michael Wachholz, that you gave him alcohol, you gave him GHB, you gave him other drugs, and then by your own handwriting, you wrote without his permission, you gave him some sort of inhalant? I'm not going to answer that. When you wrote that the defendant was an accomplice to the capital felony committed by another and was relatively minor in participation, does that account for the fact that you also wrote in your own motion that you yourself made the decision that the only humane way to end Michael uh, Jason Galehouse's life was to strangle him because somebody had punched him in the genitals? I'm not going to answer that, and Your Honor, this is not appropriate. I'm going to allow it, but Mr. Diaz, I mean, these are all certainly things it appears that uh, you have the ability to ar make argument on, the things that are in the record, the statements that he's acknowledged and accepted. I understand, Your Honor. I just want to ask him if he wants to admit to any of these things, if he doesn't want to, and Your Honor is going to allow him to not answer questions, even though I think he I'm has to. I'm not going to force him to answer questions, because it doesn't appear that he wants to answer any. I understand. Mr. Lorenzo, when you wrote in paragraph 4, the defendant acted under extreme duress or under the substantial domination of another, isn't it true that in your 147-page motion, you also wrote that you were the master dominant, Scott Schweikert was basically the newbie in training, and that you were the one in charge at the end of the day? I'm not going to answer that. Mr. Lorenzo, other than the mitigation that is listed here, there's the four that I've gone over and then there's the catch-all, number five. Is there any other mitigation that you believe should apply or should be considered or in any way needs to be taken into account in this case? I'm not going to answer that. I have a question, Jordan. Thank you. All right. Mr. Lorenzo, um, just while you're up here, I'm going to ask you, I I'm not going to... Well, I'm going to give you the opportunity, sure. which I think we really covered when I told you that it was your chance to submit anything and to say anything. Right. But just to be very, very clear, since we are specifically talking about in this proceeding, um, mitigating circumstances. Right. So similar to the last question from Mr. Diaz that you chose not to answer, are there any either previously um, cited in any documents including the document that Mr. Um, Gonzalez filed on your behalf. Is there anything else that you want this 
court to weigh as mitigation against the aggravating factors that the state is uh, presenting? Uh, no. Okay. Yes. All I'm right. good on that. Thank All you. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. For return to your seat. I don't see you standing, Mr. Diaz, so I guess there isn't something that you are um, anxious to tell me. Uh, no, Your Honor, I, I apologize. I was standing because I wanted to get your attention when you were talking to Mr. Lindor. I didn't want to just cut in. So oh, you were standing? Until, I didn't see you. No, no, it. earlier. That's why I was standing because you had kind of gotten to the defense rest, and I was like, wait, wait, I want to ask you about whether or not the defendant's testifying or not. But I don't, at this point, I, I decided not to, and then you made me put him on the stand. Well, uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, at this point, I don't, I don't think we have anything further, so okay. I don't know. So now I'm going to turn to him to see what he's decided about whether we're going to submit written uh, memorandums, sentencing memorandums, or whether there is any opportunity to simply proceed to closing arguments and then allow me to deliberate and take into consideration. Uh, because here's the thing. Both sides have rested. There's nothing additional that this court is going to have to consider. I have it all now. It's all fresh. And as I said, the normal procedure, if there were 12 people sitting in that jury box, I would give them some, I, I, I say simple, but I, I don't mean that. They're not lengthy instructions. They're not simple instructions. But I would give them some instructions, and I would send them back into that jury room to begin del deliberating the appropriate sentence in this case. Since you've waived the jury, essentially I sit in that role. I wear that hat at this time. And... Um, it is a little unusual because then if the jury was to come back with a recommendation of death, we would take some time before sentencing, and that is where I would have each side submit sentencing memorandums. We would have what is called a Spencer hearing, and then ultimately I would write a, a, an order and render my decision. It's my sentencing uh, decision in the end, but having the benefit of the findings of the jury. We don't have that in this case. So, as I said, I wear that initial hat of the jury, and what I brought up this morning was the possibility of us now having the state make a final argument, turning to you and having you make a final argument. There's no rebuttal in these, so that, that would be it. Um, and then I would deliberate over uh, tonight and into tomorrow morning and bring you back tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and I would give an oral, uh, if I need more time, I will take more time. I will not rush my decision. I will not consider my 10 o'clock tomorrow as a, as a deadline for myself. As I said, if I need more time, I would take more time. But I would pronounce on the record um, when I was prepared to do so at or around 10 o'clock tomorrow my decision in this case. And then we would follow it up with a written order that is uh, consistent with the oral findings and pronouncement that I make tomorrow. So as I said, though, Ms. Lorenzo, I am very concerned ultimately about all of your rights, your due process rights, and if I were to sentence you to death, the fact that the Florida Supreme Court will review everything. They will check every I and every T to make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. But it is also uh, very, I believe, helpful if I ask you what your preference is, particularly on this, that might be a deviation if it can be considered as such, although I don't know because it is a very rare, unique circumstance to be where we're at here. But as I've said, since you've waived the jury, and essentially I am the jury, and we expect juries to be able to go out and deliberate at this time, I don't know why the Supreme Court would have an issue with me taking that role in deliberating rather than waiting for memorandums of law. But you indicated that you might want to write something or um, sit and listen to the state and then stand up and do a presentation. I will give you time. It's 2 o'clock. Um, I mean, I won't say let's start that right now, but I need to know what you want to do. I prefer to wait and get the memorandums. There's a, I have a lot of little notes here. I have scribbled stuff. I thought I was going to have six weeks to sit down, and I'm not the type of person that can just go up and do a closing thing without preparing it and putting it down on paper. So I don't want to be rushed. I'm not ready. I'm just not prepared to try this right. I would love to do it because I'd love to get it done, but I'm not ready. If I thought I, you know, and so I'd prefer to do that. I really would. I feel more comfortable because I can get my thoughts out and put them out and uh, figure out how I'm going to present that. You see where I'm coming from? So, no, I, I, uh, I, I, I respect whatever your position right. is. I didn't know you had made some statements earlier about um, because of the fact that you are encouraging me, if you still are, to impose the death sentence. And again, not that I've predetermined in any way, but if I was to make that decision 
and decide that, as the state is asking me, and it appears that you want me to, yes. I want to make sure that the record is clear with appropriate deliberation and I follow procedure. But if I was to do that tomorrow, I suspect that you would be on the first bus to um, so. death row. If um, So I didn't know if that was something that, that you wanted to expedite. Um, if, if, if yeah, right. I was to send it to, right, exactly. to death. Yes. Uh, uh, no, I still prefer to do the memorandum. Right. Yes, I feel right. more comfortable. Yeah, Mr. Yes. Yeah. What, in light of what Mr. Lorenzo has said, um, what is the state? Does the state um, wish to ask me to do otherwise, which I don't think is wise, in an abundance of caution? Absolutely. So it's it's very interesting. He's like, well, I'm not a big talker, but it's a very interesting way he he wants the time to do to this. Forty five days. I'm going to shorten the uh, the time frames for the written memorandums. So it'll be very interesting to see how they handle this. Um, I mean, we already know how they handle this, but it's interesting how the judge is doing this. I think he's doing a very good job of uh, taking care of this in a way that works. Because otherwise, yeah, this opens up a, you know, he's worried about protecting the guy's rights, but he's also worried about protecting the record in case of, uh, in case of an appeal, which he knew was going to happen. And as we had demonstrated, we know has happened. So part of it is that they didn't do anything right at the sentencing hearings. And, this judge is making sure, hey, look, we did everything we were supposed to do. It's not our fault. <clears throat> so in the in the finest of government official traditions. And uh well, we would ask the court to proceed today. We believe that the families have been patient, been in a long time. They certainly want to see this come to an end. Um, if this was a trial, the defendant would give a closing. There's every reason to believe that closing would occur right now. Um, and then your honor, you know, your honor as the jury would, would make a decision. And you know, sometimes juries come back in 10 minutes or 10 hours, but there would be a, a decision somewhere in the relatively near future. Um, and so I think that both of the mothers are here. One has come from south of the county. One of them has come from a whole other state. They waited a very long time. And so we're asking to proceed forward today. We would like to get some sort of decision finality one way or another. All right. I appreciate that. Obviously, uh, Mr. Lorenzo, you still object to that? Yes, I want it done. The, I feel it should be done the right way. I don't want to, I don't think it should be rushed. We've spent five years. Well, I, I don't necessarily know that it's the wrong way. It's a way that certainly is going to get tested if I do it that way. Right. But I don't know what the result of that test is going to be yeah. as I sit here. Uh -oh. The question, the thing I have is I'm not prepared to get up there and be able to present my, my closings. So that, I feel, is not appropriate. Well, I don't necessarily disagree with Mr. Diaz that if there had been a jury there, um, you would. This would be the time for closings. The issue that is somewhat um, gray here is the memorandum that is usually submitted after a jury. The closings are done. The jury makes their, I hate to call it a recommendation, they make their finding. Then if and only if they vote unanimously for death, then we proceed and it's the judge's opportunity to have a Spencer hearing to consider a sentencing memorandum. Here there's no jury. We've removed the jury. So again, it's somewhat of a gray area. Um, but I trust that the state in consultation amongst themselves uh, are comfortable because it certainly is in no one's best interest that we have an issue that would cause this to come back should the court sentence Mr. Lorenzo to death. And it appears that the state is comfortable in that decision to bypass the sentencing memorandum, the Spencer hearing, and to simply have this court sit as the jury, proceed to closing arguments, give you a decision, whatever that decision may be, and that that would not be the subject of any 
controversy or reason to have to do this all over knowing that it would go again if i was to make that finding directly to the florida supreme court to review every procedure uh everything that was done in this case and if the state is comfortable i will uh um take five minutes and come back and let you know if i am comfortable accepting the state's representation to that and if so we'll proceed to closing arguments um mr lorenzo over your objection clearly right. over your objection I don't, I don't believe my due process is being is, is going to be violated that's what i believe yeah. all right well um i'll be back in five minutes well <laughs> Uh, the hang-up's kind of the death penalty bench trial issue there, <clears throat> but it's making sure he does it the right way. They've got to do it the right way. So remember his whole issue the entire time was my due process rights. He felt like things were being violated, not properly done. And that was the uh, issue there. Brand saying, go find another case to try, fat ass. I'm not sure. Uh, nobody wants to hear your closing. But they have to do their job. They have to do it the right way. So that's why they're they're very much about wanting to get this done. Brandon says, how is he in jail for 20 years? He had a federal drug charge and rape charges and things he was already charged with back in 2006. He's already doing federal prison time. So... That's that's what's going on with him. He's already doing a long, long. He's already doing time, so that's the issue. Um, you know, he's sixty-five, and his release date is. He was given two hundred years, uh, Brandon. His release date federally is in 2175. So he's got another 125 years to go. So that's why there wasn't a rush. The state was busy putting together their case. So if you give him the death sentence, does he get time served? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. And anyways, guys, I do want to say, um, because you can find these at... Um, couple different things that are out there and available for you are over at the merch store a couple new things that we've put together you guys can find and while they're on this break a um, couple different things here like the uh, Steven Lorenzo coffee mug the defendant being an experienced bondage master I didn't just want to put down experienced bondage master because I'm sure some of you would get weird looks at work or wherever it is you hang out at, um, you know, a couple different couple different shirts out there. I don't know. We're a couple of things we put together. Um, it's Clyde approved. Um, the prices. I don't know why I put all these prices up there. I'm trying to fix those, but I'll be working on fixing that. Uh, trying to get Clyde's face on a shirt. That's that's becoming a pain in the ass though. If he played his cards right, he could have been Duncan with Diddy. So, yeah, guys, this is at the, uh, this is at the, uh, this is at the merch link down below. You guys click on it. Buy a shirt for your shirt. Yeah, buy a mug, buy a coffee cup for your coffee cup. Experienced Bondage Master would sell out very quickly. Yes, yes, that, I'm sure it would. I'm sure it would. Yes. <laughs> I thought about that, but it's uh something I need to I need to keep the mommy group at the playground may look at you funny, yes. Yes, they could. Um I'm gonna work on the bondage one a little bit more because that needs to get redone a little bit. But yeah, there's a couple muted and boomered. I think that's the only way Teespring is letting me put up there because muted itself is trademarked by a lot of people. Um the Clyde stuff. This is just the basic stuff. If you guys like want to see other things, 
to let me know. I'm working on putting the rest of it up there. Do I have condoms? No. Oh, uh, not not yet. No, 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 no. Storm might also be like, nah, fuck that. Yeah, they, they might. Muted is trademarked. Well, here's a st muted in different fonts and styles has been trademarked and in coloring. Um, there's actually like if you go and look for the trademarks there, there's all kinds of stuff trademarked. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of cheating. He's running up there like he was in a hurry to plead the fifth. Yeah. What happened with rackets? What was the yelling about? I feel like I missed something. Oh, you need to go back and uh, go back to Alyssa. Just Google uh, Nick yells at uh, Sean. Just search that on YouTube. You will find out what happened. I don't have 20 minutes to go through it again, so we're not doing that. So we're not going to do that tonight. Let's get back to the video, though. We've got just a little bit left, guys. So, Mr. Lorenzo, you're standing. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can be seated. Did you need to say something? Yes, I'd like to. Um, I believe that I have a constitutional right to dispense a hearing. I have not had a chance to see the, tri the transcripts of this. Uh, proceeding. I have the right to review the transcripts of the proceeding. I have the right to see what the state is going to put forth in their memorandum so I can prepare myself to appropriately respond. So I feel I have the constitutional right to have those transcripts, review the transcripts, as, a, as any normally procedure would be. All right, I appreciate that. What say the state? Does Mr. Lorenzo have a right to the transcripts of this proceeding and to a Spencer hearing, Mr. Diaz? Or is it the state's position that he does not? Your Honor, we exist uh, obviously in a unique situation, not unique, it's happened before, but an unusual situation. Um, I want to first remind the court, even though I know Your Honor knows it and Mr. Lorenzo knows it, we are in part in this position because Mr. Lorenzo has exercised his right for which he cannot be punished, but he has chosen to act as his own counsel. If Mr. Gonzalez was his attorney and was his counsel, I expect you would tell Mr. Gonzalez it's the time to give the closing, just as the style of the state is the time to give the closing. Mr. Lorenzo is warned when he chooses to self-represent that he doesn't get special treatment, so we would ask to do the closing. We, and that's a different question. I, I, I have a decision on that. And assuming we do the closings today, can I deliberate and pronounce? Well, I can tell you the case law says that I must do a written order concurrent with a rendition of a death um, sentence. And that's not the type of order that I can do overnight. So we can't come back tomorrow and I pronounce a decision regarding death without a, a written order. And I'm not going to do a, a written order overnight on that it just can't be done I'm saying nothing. so but now mr lorenzo has raised an additional and that is his entitlement to a spencer hearing including his entitlement to the transcripts of these proceedings and as i sit here right now i'm not sure but i turn to the state and ask you because again i don't want to trample on his rights i don't want to create a reason for us to come back here so is it your position that he is not entitled if we do closings today assuming i've made that decision and i'm going to allow you to close allow him any opportunity to close but then the next step, is he entitled to a Spencer hearing? Is he entitled to the transcripts of this proceeding and to see what you say before he makes his final request either for or against the death penalty? I understand, Your Honor, and forgive me, I don't like to answer a question with a question. Well, and it was a lengthy, complex, complicated, compound question, so I apologize. The, I'll accept your objection, but I won't be frank. The question is, what are we talking about? And I understand that since it's the same person in both instances, it's difficult to delineate them. But are you making the decision as the finder of fact in place of the jury? Or are you making the decision as the judge at the end of the Spencer hearing? Or are you doing both at the same time? Because if it was a jury, we would close, and a jury would make a decision, and then there would be a Spencer hearing. And then the judge would make the decision. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but in this situation, judge and jury are the same person. And so we are ready to close. We are ready to ask Your Honor to impose a death sentence, and we are ready for Your Honor to rule. I understand, as you said, that there is a requirement that you must issue a written ruling as an official and final pronouncement at the end of a Spencer hearing. Um, I do not, but I'm not really clear. I hear you, I hear you, and it is, it's confusing. But the thing is, at the end of the day, since I'm the one who's making the final decision, it is the final ruling. So yes, if you want to hear what I would say as the jury, it's a little bit silly to say, where in my hat is the jury, this is what I say, now it goes to the judge for a Spencer hearing and all that. So ultimately what I say is the final decision and the question is, as Mr. Lorenzo has raised, before I make a final decision as the judge, 
is he entitled to all of those things? We would only get there, yes, if a jury was to come back with a recommendation of death. So it's, we're in the stage where it appears that for us to get to the final decision of the judge, we have to presume under these circumstances where there is no jury that they've made such a recommendation so that I can get to the final conclusion. But under those circumstances where the jury has made such a recommendation, we then follow it with a Spencer hearing and a written order. The case law is relatively clear. It says that I cannot make a pronouncement of death without a concurrent written order that is filed at the same time. That has to do with filing deadlines and, and things that start to take. So I can't just say today, listen to closing argument, say, Mr. Lorenzo, I sent you to death and I'll write an order and get it to you in 30 days. That can't happen. I agree. I don't believe that the rule requires that Mr. Lorenzo has to be provided, be provided a written transcript. I know that's your honor's practice. Uh, I know that that's your honor's practice because as you outlined, I think yesterday, you talked about how we would order transcripts, going when the transcripts are available, then you would ask for written arguments to be submitted, then your honor would review the written arguments, and then you would... Well, and I said that I was willing to, uh, to shorten any time frames and expedite um, the, the final Okay. Sentencing hearing. And, and I, I think that there is just a disconnect between your honor is very methodical, and I appreciate the fact that you're very methodical. When you say I want to order the transcripts, I want to review all the transcripts, then I want to have written argument, then I want to issue my written ruling. But it's also very fresh in my mind now, which is why I had suggested that I'm saying. perhaps we bypass. But that's for the benefit of a jury, which we have no jury. So I have to jump into my role now at the end, and I think the appropriate thing to do is to presume that a jury would have which has no ultimate effect on my decision. I can accept the jury's determination or I can reject the jury's determination. But in order to get to my final decision, I think we have to presume at this point, and you're welcome to give a closing argument that you wish to give to a jury, but I think that, that technically I have to make that presumption in order to get to my final determination. I understand, Your Honor, and, and obviously the, the intention hey, is Dolly. to Hi, Hella. get to some sort of Hi, guys. answer as quickly as possible for the families who've been waiting. Um, I don't, it's not really a matter of I'm just dying to make a closing argument, although I'm happy to do one. I think the, the end goal is to try and get to where we're, to where we have an answer, and it sounds like it's not going to come tomorrow no matter what. Yeah, it saying. can't come tomorrow no matter what, but, but, I can do a Spencer, I can do, set a Spencer, I can do, have you do your closing, um, give Mr. Lorenzo the opportunity to do any closing, set a Spencer hearing in, I'm in a trial next week, but I can set a Spencer hearing the week after, which is two weeks out. And I can set a sentencing on February, where'd my JA go? 24th, I think it was, it's the which is the Friday. So it'd be an expedited uh, um, process, but I'm willing to do that. I just to make sure that, again, all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. Even if that's over Mr. Lorenzo's objection, I'm, I'm comfortable expediting it to that degree. Mr. Lorenzo? Yeah, I was just talking about that. I, that was going to be a suggestion that I was going to say, let them close if they want to close. But I still would like to get a sentencing transcript so I can look at it and review it. I mean, I have, I'm entitled to that no matter what. And, uh, as, uh, That's debatable, but, 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 yes. but I, I still, in an abundance of caution, may, uh, may, may try to satisfy all those potential um, loopholes. Uh, Mia, how long uh, can you turn a transcript around on the past few days? The testimony, just the testimony, not all this uh, stuff. <laughs> I would say pushing it would be Friday afternoon, but this, I prefer this Monday. Friday? Yeah, Monday? Monday? Not, not a problem. I appreciate that. Yep. All right. Yeah. So I can satisfy that um, and still do a Spencer hearing the week after and a sentencing um, either at the end of that week or uh, the week after. No, so, no, you can't. So that yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, Friday. The Friday would be the 24th. I can do the Spencer hearing the Monday? It's the 20th. Uh, tell me that again. So February 20th is Monday mm -hmm. for the Spencer hearing. And then February 20, Friday, Friday. 24th. Monday's the 20th, and then Friday's the 24th. Oh, yeah. Monday, I, I, Monday, you'll keep me and forgot. So it has to be one straight. <laughs> no, I'll be with I can't, I can't do the Spencer and the sentencing that close. So we'll just 
All right, this is what we're going to do. Um, say, assuming that you are uh, still requesting to do this, I'm going to proceed to closings at this time, allow you to do whatever closing um, you would normally do in front of a jury or that you want to do in front of me. I will then give Mr. Lorenzo an opportunity to do any closing that he wishes. I will bring you back February 20th for a Spencer hearing, and then I will set the sentencing for February 24th, which is the Friday of that week. And, Your Honor, I anticipate that the state may be asking you to make sure that it's uh, Zoom accessible for the Spencer hearing as one of the witnesses will likely be back on stage. Absolutely. Or not witnesses the next year. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you, um, for the Spencer hearing, um, any idea how long the state anticipates No, I don't, I don't think we're going to have anything. Right. I didn't think it'd be very long. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm not canceling my other thing that day. I'm just moving it to later. Yes. All right. All right. And and, and, and obviously, Ms. Lorenzo, um, no rush on you. Anything that you need to want to um, present at the Spencer here on February 20th, you will have every opportunity to do so. And then I will have, um, I'm going to get the transcripts out. Mia, I'll order those transcripts um, as soon as we get them on Monday or Tuesday. We'll, uh, we'll provide them, and that'll be sufficient time prior to the Spencer hearing, which is scheduled for February 20th. Yes, Mr. Gonzalez. Judge, uh, I spoke to Mia, and if she was capable of just emailing it to me in a PDF, I will print it, and I will make sure that Mr. Lorenzo has it the same day as available. All right, well, whatever procedure, I, um, Mia, is that acceptable? Yes, sir. All right, then that's what we'll do. Okay, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, Mr. Diaz, is the state ready to close? Yes, sir. Thank you. You may proceed. Stephen Lorenzo began this proceeding telling Your Honor, I want this court to think I am the worst thing on two feet. I will not stand up here and ask Your Honor to decide that, but I will ask you to decide that what Stephen Lorenzo did is deserving of the imposition of the death penalty. In order to prevail, and the state will prevail, we have to prove the existence of aggravating factors beyond a reasonable doubt, and the state of Florida has done that. Specifically in this case, there are four aggravating factors that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The first was that Stephen Lorenzo was previously convicted of a felony involving the use or threat of violence to another person. We have submitted in State's Exhibit Number 9 the certified copy of conviction from the federal court. We have also put on the testimony, either in person or through prior testimony in federal court, of seven victims who told you exactly what went into those crimes, how they were drugged, how they were bound, how they were tortured, how they were abused, how violence was committed against them. The state of Florida has more than proven that beyond a reasonable doubt. It is a decision written in paper for all time as a certainty that Mr. Lorenzo has previously committed violence against others. The state has also proven beyond uh, the reasonable doubt the defendant was engaged or the accomplice in the commission of a sexual battery and or kidnapping at the time of these offenses. And though I will talk about it in a bit, uh, no matter which version of events you talk about, whether it's the, a version of events that aligns with what Mr. Schweikert says, or the version of events that align with what Mr. Lorenzo suggests is the truth. Either way, that's exactly what Stephen Lorenzo was doing. What you will see is that Stephen Lorenzo is a person who has lured men, often under false pretenses, into a place where they are vulnerable and isolated, where they are what he often calls easy prey. And in those moments, when he wears a bright, shiny, smiling face of a friendly person, he secretly drugs them, and then he takes advantage of them. He binds them against their will so they cannot leave, and then he just commits unconscionable acts of sexual violence against another person. You have heard that. You have seen that. You have seen here the pictures of what happened to Michael Wachholz, which are completely consistent and indicative of Stephen Lorenzo enjoys kidnapping people, battering them, and in the case of these poor unfortunates, ultimately murdering them. Stephen Lorenzo was in the commission of and engaged in other crimes at the time he committed these murders. The state of Florida has also shown that the defendant's uh, actions were especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. And I point to the word or because it can be any of those. But when you look at the definitions, all of them are terms that any person would apply to exactly what occurred in this case. Heinous means extremely wicked or shockingly evil. Everything Stephen Lorenzo has done to Michael Wachholz and Jason Galehouse is shocking. It is evil. It is shockingly evil. 
Atrocious means outrageously wicked or vile. Everything that you've heard about here is outrageous. It is wicked. It is vile. Cruel means designed to inflict a high degree of pain with utter indifference to or even enjoyment of the suffering of others. And the state submits to your honor that that's why Stephen Lorenzo does this. He does this because he enjoys torturing. He enjoys inflicting emotional distress on other people. He thrives off the fear. That's his real true fetish. When you read the chat logs, what you will see is Stephen Lorenzo enjoys what he calls the mind fuck. He doesn't just want to sexually batter these men. He doesn't just want to imprison these men. He wants to scare them, to terrorize them, and to see them suffer. That is heinous, that is atrocious, and that is cruel, but it is certainly at least one of those things. The murder was committed in a cold, calculated, or premeditated manner without any pretense of moral or legal justification. And that second part is easy. There is nothing moral nor legal about what Stephen Lorenzo did to Jason Gailhaus and Michael Walkholz. Not a single thing. And is it cold? Is it the product of calm and cool reflection? Well, of course it is. He was discussing it. He was planning it. He was getting it all lined up for weeks in advance. Chat records stretch all the way back to October for crimes that are committed in the middle of December. And everything about them shows planning. It shows that he is calm and coolly thinking about what he's doing. No one is sitting at this computer making Stephen Lorenzo type these things with a gun to his head. Calculated means having a careful plan or a prearranged design to commit murder. Go back and look at the chat logs. See how Mr. Lorenzo talks about how they're going to get drugs and how they're going to grind them into a powder and how they'll get them into a drink and all the things that they're going to do, all the plans that they're going to do, the way that they're going to engage in some ruse or they discuss whatever they can to get these people back into being unsuspecting, isolated, easy prey. Is it premeditated? Yes. But as your court knows, premeditation in this is not just the typical premeditation of first degree murder. It is premeditation that requires a heightened level of premeditation demonstrated by a substantial period of reflection. And I submit to your honor that this is not a crime that took place in minutes. It's not a crime that took place in hours. This is a crime that was built and thought and worked on for days and weeks and months. He may not have known the name Michael Wachholz. He may not have known the name Jason Gerhaus until the night he found them, but it didn't matter who it was. When he had his chance, he was going to carry out a plan that he had been building in his mind, a plan, not a fantasy, as he will tell you, because he suggests that that was all fantasizing, but not a bit of it was fantasy, because as Stephen Lorenzo writes in one of the chats, he's going to turn fantasy into reality, and he did. His fantasy was cruel, it was horrible, it was heinous, it was atrocious, it was cold, it was calculated, but it was a plan. It was a plan that he was always building. The state of Florida has proven that the aggravating factors in this case have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and then, Your Honor, we'll have to answer the question as to whether or not the aggravated factors are sufficient to warrant a possible sentence of death, and the state says overwhelmingly, yes. What Stephen Lorenzo did is more than sufficient to warrant a possible sentence of death. To do this to one person would be enough to warrant a possible sentence of death. To do it to two in the space of a 24-hour period for the sheer thrill of it is absolutely sufficient to warrant a possible sentence of death. That brings us then to the third issue. Were one or more mitigating circumstances established by the greater weight of the evidence? And I will leave that for your honor to decide. Mr. Lorenzo has set forth several in his 147 page mitigation notice. But even if there were mitigation, the mitigating circumstances, is, uh, where the mitigating circumstances do not outweigh the greater weight of the aggravation. The aggravation here is immense, monumental. The mitigation by Mr. Lorenzo is first hard to understand. Mr. Lorenzo's first piece of mitigation is that he had no significant prior history. And if the question is, did he have any prior history to the date that he killed Michael Walpole to Jason Gailhouse? Well, we know that that's not the case because the conviction comes later. But go back and look at the dates that these events happened, the dates that those convictions were ultimately obtained for. They're Albert Perkins, February of 2000. They're Joseph Leach, December of 2000. They're Sergio Garcia, November of 2001. Joey Alva, December of 2002. Juan Ortiz, May of 2003. Jared Paragoy, July of 2003. Only one of them, Christopher Lear, is, December, is uh, October of 2004. So if the question is, was he actually convicted prior to 2003? Well, yes, obviously that's not the case, but that's not the way the law works. The question is, as he sits here today, does he have a prior conviction? And so the state submits to you that whatever mitigation that is worth, it does not even come close to eclipsing the monumental amount of aggravation. Mr. Lorenzo's second 
uh, allegation is that the victims participated or that they consented to these acts. Those chat records are replete with examples that Stephen Lorenzo has no actual interest in consensual sex. Whether he's talking about luring straight men under the false pretenses of let's go have a beer, whether it's finding people, as he describes, wandering the streets of the city of Tampa, because we have this event that occurs in Tampa somewhere where people get drunk in the streets and just wander around, which we all know is Gasparilla, and then you can just get those people when they're drunkenly stumbling through the streets. Whether it's giving them GHB, either intentionally or getting it to him secretly when the victim doesn't know it's coming, whether it's as he confesses in his own 147-page motion where he gives substances to Michael Wachholz without Mr. Wachholz even knowing, there is no way on earth that any person could reasonably conclude that anything about what Stephen Lorenzo did to those two men, they were actually knowingly and intentionally participating and consenting to. Consent is a word that does not exist in Stephen Lorenzo's sex life. And it certainly doesn't exist in Stephen Lorenzo's criminal behavior. The defendant was an accomplice and a relatively minor participant. That's his third piece of mitigation. Stephen Lorenzo writes, in no uncertain terms, in his own motion, you can go find it, the mitigation. He will say, he made the decision. He made the decision to kill Jason Gatehouse. And this is the scenario that he says. He says that Jason Gatehouse came over and, of course, voluntarily consented to all of these things that were going to happen to him. And then in the middle of it, by Stephen Lorenzo's own words, he says, Schweikert, loses control and proceeds to punch Mr. Gayhaus in the genitalia. Now, as a man, that's certainly not a pleasant thing that anyone wants to think about, but it is never a situation, no matter how rushed you might suddenly think the moment is, where you would go, well, the only rational answer, the only humane answer, as Mr. Lorenzo suggests in his mitigation notice, is we should strangle that person to death. Because that's what he says. He says that he has a quick little meeting with some other number of men, and they all decide the only thing that we could do when somebody else gets punched in the genitals is we're just going to have to kill them. Oh, and we're going to do it because we fully understand that at the end of the day what we're doing is we're saving our own skin. That is not the action of a relatively minor participant acting as an accomplice. That is Steve Lorenzo being the ringleader in a scenario where he himself says he's the master dominant and Schweiker is the newbie learning the ropes. Well, he's the one calling the shots. It's his house. It's his bed. It's his camera. It's his call. He even said that to Your Honor in the transcript from December 6th when he told you the series of events. He said, I made the decision. He cannot now ask you to believe that whatever mitigation there is in him being an accomplice with relatively minor participation outweighs the aggravation. Finally, Mr. Lorenzo suggests that he acted under extreme duress and substantial domination. In Mr. Lorenzo's motion, he takes the time starting somewhere around page 93, to discuss what happened with the other victim, the test run victim. And he talks about how Mr. Schweiker lost his control then, acted inappropriately, and how things got out of hand. And he flat out says Mr. Schweiker was sexually assaulting that particular gentleman. And that is days before Jason Gerhaus or Michael Wachholz ever came into the picture. And still, Mr. Lorenzo said, hey, Mr. Schweiker, even though he came into my house and he sexually battered someone in my own house and he created this gigantic disaster, let's go find another guy and let's bring him back to the house and let's try it again. And then, when that one goes unbelievably wrong because the person is dead and then dismembered and then discarded, he says, you know what? Third time's the charm. Let's try it one more time. And then, to complicate it, Mr. Lorenzo says, and by the way, I pumped a bunch of alcohol and drugs into that victim before we ultimately killed him too. Nothing about that is duress. Not a single bit of it. Not a single bit of it suggests there was domination. Mr. Lorenzo can say it, and if Your Honor attaches any weight to it as mitigation, so be it. But when the question comes, does the mitigation in any way get even in the vicinity of outweighing the aggravation, the answer is categorically no. There is one answer that is the appropriate answer here, and only one answer. What Stephen Lorenzo did was heinous, atrocious, cruel. It was cold, calculated, premeditated. It was an action taken in furtherance of other crimes and to prevent his own apprehension to cover up his crimes. And that is after having a history stretching all the way back to 2000 for men that he had done things similar, though thankfully not as final to. The state of Florida believes there is only one 
just answer here. Stephen Lorenzo deserves the death penalty. The state of Florida has proven that the aggravating factors exist beyond a reasonable doubt. The aggravating factors are sufficient to warrant a sentence of death. The aggravating factors outweigh whatever mitigation might exist. And so on the question of should the defendant be sentenced to death, the state of Florida asks that you find the only correct answer, and that is yes, Stephen Lorenzo should be sentenced to death. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Lorenzo, I know that you have indicated that you may or may not be prepared at this time, but essentially that's one of the things that you and representing yourself have put you in. You are no differently situated than Mr. Diaz was, except that he has training and experience in this, but you acknowledge that, that you don't have that, and that, that ultimately might be a disadvantage to you. Mm -hmm. But again, you are no differently situated in essentially your ability to present a closing argument at this time. So it is your opportunity to present a closing argument. Um, I'm going to wait. There's nothing for me to do. And, and you are absolutely entitled to do that. Right. So uh, you're waiving your closing. Let me uh, just, what we're going to do is I've given out the dates. So guys, yeah, that's, that's it. He's just like, yeah, I'm going to phone it in. I'm done. So, uh-huh. Oh. Little, uh, little, uh. What hole do you think he wants to fuck everybody in the state in? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, President-elect Phil Swift said for $5. Um, what? Is this frozen up? Oh, shit. It's going to crash. I think it's good. Oh, no, it did. Oh, wow. Chile, Chile de Castro goes to jail and American infrastructure starts getting destroyed. This is all connected, Sean. Yes, we must. We must free them. We don't stop. That was the, That was what the. That's what the boat crew screamed as they hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge. We don't stop. <laughs> uh, this sounds sense a quitter. Yeah, but I think for him dragging all this out, that was his. Uh, that was that's what got him all hot and bothered. So he probably enjoyed that. I mean, he'd probably whack off to it if he could. That that thrill of. Uh, making everybody to suffer and go through the motions. So. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. I want to say hi to Dolly and hi to Hella. And all people came over in the raid. Good to see you guys. Um, yeah, we got a little bit of time left. I do want to touch on this because something I kept talking about with the uh, What the Hales case and some things that don't make sense to me is... JL says, if he wants a death penalty, what's the point of this? You have to follow the rules. So the death penalty, if he wants it, the state still has to show that he deserves a death penalty. The court still has to show everything he did, the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating factors. You know, due process. We, everybody, we, this is how the system holds itself accountable. We do the process for everybody, no matter what. So that's why, that's why we're doing that. That's why we did this. That's why he had it happen to him. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's why we do it. Yeah, the court has to show he's not crazy. They're going to show he's not cuckoo. They're going to show they had the evidence, all the things to sustain it. Because remember, if they didn't do all that, the, the appeals attorneys would make, you know, they could make mincemeat out of all these things, like, how do we know stuff was followed? How do we know things were protected right, done right? You know, that that's part of the issue. And let's say he wants to have it done to himself, but let's say he's crazy. Or let's say he wants it done, but he's got some weird ulterior motive, but he actually didn't do it. You know, we want to make sure it's done right. So, that's why. Um... I still don't get it. Does he want it or not? It's like he's strapping on the cage on himself by fighting. I mean, he wants it, but he's not going to get, he's not going to help them. I guess is why he's not participating. I don't know. You're asking me, you're asking me to give you the logic and reasoning of a certified fucking crazy man. Like that's, I don't know how to tell you that. I can't tell you anything there. So, and guys, give me one second here. I will be right back. Um, I got to, Right back real quick, guys. Hold on, chat. Um.
why is he asking for the additional hearing? Well, that additional hearing, um, he has the right to present his, he has the right to present his arguments. And that foster hearing is like an additional step. So he's going to abuse the system in a way like, this is him exerting control. So he's going to use that as much as he can. And he's going to say all the things he wants to say. So that's more or less why he's doing it. So now this is something I've been asking for with these, what the hell's people. And I'm only just going to cover this real quick. And then we're going to call it early tonight chat. This is, oh, so appearing in court to be the star of the show. Yeah. He was teasing the audience. I mean, he was tormenting people. He tormented the state. He made them have to waste all their fucking time and all their effort and waste time on dealing with him. I mean, he's lived rent free in their head. So that's why they did. That's why he did all this. It's all, it's all about causing sorrow and pain. He loves that. That that's part of it. Um, he doesn't care necessarily about the audience being unsatisfied, but he, he wanted to cause all the pain he could. And he's like, great. Um, he kind of likes that passive infliction of pain. I guess I'd say ghostery. And, uh, yeah, guys, real quick. Um, chat doesn't understand how BDSM op master operates. Yeah, that's a bit... Of, there's there's different ways that you can exert, you know, your pain and control. So. But getting back to this issue with the what the hails, um, I told you guys something seemed fucking weird with this from the start. And... Yeah, there's there's a bit of an issue there. And uh, I guess, hold on, we'll get to this question here. So the of-age homegirl basic female, yes, they're both seeking the death penalty, and the court still has to order it. So yes, they both want it. Yep. Jail said, why did it take 20 years? I think part of the issue was they, they needed confessions, and Schweiker didn't want to give a confession till late. And that was part of the issue. It was a cold case. They didn't have enough to convict until the co-defendants started turning over. So, and also keep in mind that his case was indicted. He was indicted in 2016. So this case is a little older anyway. No, this is, and, and you're saying more what the hell is better be good. Well, this isn't really the first thing I've ever talked to him about. And no, this is just looking at the uh, paperwork that got filed in their federal case. This just this is very fucking weird to me. So this part's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blah 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 blah. So and yeah, this is the thing here. So this is this is the protection order um, out of the state of Ohio. So this is what you get. This is what your front page is, and it's a warning to you that this order is enforceable. You know, in all 50 counties, or I'm sorry, in all counties in Ohio and all 50 states, the District of Columbia, tribal lands, and U.S. territories. And that's all pursuant to the Violence Against Women Act. Not only mentioned states may have their own rules. Okay. Um, they get through all this, and now this is the actual part of the order that matters. And this is the, um, he got a civil stocking protection order, which had a full hearing. And it goes through, these are all the parties, is all the stuff that goes on here. So the petitioner is Jeremy Hales. He's going after John Cook. And um, the respondent can be found at 151 North Otter Creek Avenue in Otter Creek, Florida, 32683. <clears throat> this is the part that really blows my mind because normally, normally, yeah, they got it, and it doesn't make any damn sense. You're awarding a protection order in the state of Ohio for something that's going on in Florida. Go to fucking Florida and get it. There's, you know, this is... Like, how... I, I've never, like, if you would have come to me and said, I want to file a protection order against a guy, I would have told Hills, go to fucking Florida and get it. They've moved down there. They're the broke dicks who can't come back to Ohio. 
why why would you not go get it there? Um, Hella, this is part of his uh, defamation lawsuit that they filed. Um, but this is this is an older, this is from this is from uh, what when was this granted? This got granted on um, this got granted on Halloween of 2023. So this thing that's already been in place. I just this thing does not make any sense. Why are you not in Florida getting this shit done? So, and he also got a five-year hearing, which is crazy that he got five years out of that. Because that's the maximum you can get it for. Um, he was represented by an attorney. And the other guy represent, represent, represented pro se, which is kind of normal. Um, you know, the, the court notes that the petition respond our neighbors, their property is located in Florida. Which, if I was the magistrate, I don't know why this magistrate didn't say, let's just do this in Florida. It, it's just absolutely noxious. It, completely fucking stupid it's happened this way. I mean, a lot of magistrates I would have been in front of would say, nope, we're not doing this. Completely dumb. Um, so this is the unenforceable order that wasn't implemented in one of the states. Yeah. So, this is... This is the one they were talking about where they initially all those videos started at. So. Then Latu filed as interveners. I ain't fucking intervening in this thing. Yeah, I don't know why people are getting involved in it. It's fucking weird. I don't want to be anywhere near it. That's why I don't do anything about it. I'm staying, away. I'm staying out of that mess. I'm staying out of that mess. J Rock says, who filed what now? Jeremy Hales filed it against that crazy lady Lynette and her uh, husband or boyfriend or whoever the hell they are. What are the Hales? They run a YouTube channel and they do like I don't know, clickbait and like storage wars stuff and like treasure hunting. So you know, they do really good and uh do a lot of grifting, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's just this whole thing right here. You know, tells me kind of all I need to know. Tells me all I need to know about them. This whole thing is dumb. This probably shouldn't have been granted. I can't believe it was. So, I really just don't get why it was granted. So. So, yeah, I just, it's just, I'm not impressed with it. I'm not impressed with this thing at all. Ben says, oh, I'm, uh, thank you, Ben says, oh, I'm going to come. Yeah, well, I can't stand any of them either. That's why I'm staying out of it. But this whole thing seems... They were from Ohio. They were from Ohio at one point, but then they moved down to Florida. They both moved down there. And the Hales, for some reason, they're like... They have dual residencies. Okay, which is fine. You can live in two places. But the people they're dealing with, these, like, fucking weirdos, they're stuck down in Florida. I don't know why you came to Ohio to get that. It just, it just seems so fucking dumb. It just really does. I just don't understand why they did it. So it just. Yeah, the Hales live in Ohio and do Florida 50 50, but I don't think the uh, I don't think the crazy people are doing it. I don't think Lynette and John are doing that. I don't think they have the kind of money. Carrie says maybe they lived in Florida, but the stockers were following them. Yeah, but that's they haven't elicited. You know, that's where. If that's happening, you go deal with that when you're down in Florida and you get stuff there. Um, Carrie, how do I know they're stuck? Because they shit in buckets and dump it outside. They don't have money. I'm not fucking touching this case any more than this. This is already enough. I, I already knew this is bullshit when I heard it. You know, where was this? When they said, oh, where's your uh, protection article? Oh, I can't talk about that. T bullshit. So, completely stupid. 
It's a completely stupid fucking case. Nobody's covering this case. We need you. No, they can. Everybody else can cover that fucking case. I am not touching it. Carrie, shut the fuck up. I'm not covering it, okay? Jesus. I heard you. I'm not touching it. Um, they said they went to Ohio for the protection order because they were denied in Florida. Yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah, I, I the whole thing is fucking moronic. Why they did that? Every other time, like all, all what should have happened is, um. Luke says that they don't have the money to come to Ohio. It makes sense to stir the pot, and she says drag him here. Yeah, you know what would happen in Ohio if any any magistrate was in the right fucking mind. You know what they'd say? Why are you doing this here? Go back to fucking Florida. And if I had been representing John, I'd been like, why aren't we in fucking Florida doing this? There's no point to be here. So. Um, but yeah, people were wondering, because I'd said this before, I wanted to see this document before I could comment on the case. I can comment on the case. These guys are fucking idiots on both sides. They are fucking loons. That's all I can say. They are fucking lunatics all around. Really, that's all they are. So, and now I don't have to talk about it anymore because I've seen the thing and I could say it's stupid as shit. So, that's it for them. We're done. Thank you. It's logical and on point. Yeah, I mean, the fact, like, there's no... Yeah. Um, Mama Source Rex says, thank you. It's in your streams are fresh air. Thank you. Yeah, we're just, there's, there was no, now I've seen it, it's fucking weird. I have to cover the case for finding Clyde. Hold on. Clyde! Come here, buddy. Come here, Clyde. Come here, Papa. Hi. Come here. Come here. Come on. Hey. Come here. Come here, Gunga Jim. Come here, buddy. Stop. Stop. <sighs> Dude, come on. Clyde, buddy, look, look, come here. Hey. Hey, you want a treat? Come here. Clyde, you want a treat? Come on. Come on. Hi. I got you, Bubba. I got you, Bubba. Yeah, see? Too fucking shay, Brandon. Too shay. Hey, hey, no, 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 no. You're nice. You're a nice boy. You know what I mean? Ice? We're going to do some doggy ASMR right here. Ready? Mwah. Good boy. Good boy. Mwah. Oh, that was a big yawn. That was a big doggo yawn. What you think, buddy? So, guys, yep, there you go. It's done, Brandon. I would rather find Clyde than deal with this case. So, there you go. For $5. Suck it. Suck it dry. You got something to say, buddy? Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess Clyde's done. All right, buddy. Why is Clyde so tired? Because he is. Mm. So, let's see here. Worry. Yes, Clyde saved you all. You should be thankful for this dog. He's such a good dog. I am so lucky that I found him. You know that, buddy. You're such a good boy. Mwah. And I kind of want me to cover this. I don't need to cover that. I don't need... Clyde's like looking at you like, we ain't covering that, Holmes. I don't need to cover it. It's too much. There's way too much cancer in there. 
I'll probably catch cancer from that, and I don't want cancer. It, the whole thing is cancer. I don't want it. I don't want it. And you know what, Clyde? You're such a good boy. You're sitting pretty. That's fine. There you go, buddy. So. I dare to cover this as a lawyer. I'm not fucking... I, there's rather a million things I'd rather cover. So. Clyde doesn't like me, yeah. I am about the grift, but I stay, like, there's so many other things out there to cover, though. That, that shit is not, not that. I cover Karen Reed of this. I'm not fucking covering either of them. I'll take a look at the Karen Reed thing. But it sounds like Karen Reed's asshole got blown out by the judge recently, too. The defense is getting hammered, so. Yes, and I get it. The police are corrupt in Massachusetts. Yes, they are, but. Clyde leads in, yes. Fuck Ukraine. That's very much. I like if Hell's coverage makes Clyde big sad. Well, then he's going to be sad forever. I just want to see Sean cover because it would make him mad. Why would it make me mad? Because I'd spend my entire time hoping everybody involved probably gets hit by a car. Or that I hope, it, I hope that um, by the fall, like... Hurricane Andrew comes through Levy County and just like the finger of like a tornado, like a finger of God, just just John is saying I've never seen kinder, some more kindergarten bullshit from two grown ass people. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of stuff going on out there. Um. But yeah, this one's just really YouTube drama nonsense. I'm not going to say it's all manufactured, but it kind of sounds like it. Besides, uh... Whoa, buddy, Ashton Felted. <laughs> hmm. Nobody's covering the absurdity of the hills. There are other people covering it. I think... Jeff has been covering it. I think DUI guy's been covering some of it. I think other people have too. MG Law's been covering it. So there are places you can go to find it. It's just not going to be here. So. Um, for the ghost, not for the camera. It says... Sean, did you see it? Whoa, Medicare Masochist gifted a sub. Whoa, buddy. You know what I mean? Ashen. Ack, 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 ack. You know what I mean? Buddy. Yes. Oh. Send Lorenzo down to go deal with the hails. That would be fucking hilarious. He just butt fucks everybody to death. That'd be great. We could send him after everybody. That's a problem. Lock him up in a cell with Daryl Brooks. Daryl Brooks gets butt fucked to death. Like, me grounds. He's like, the only grounds you're going to see is your face in the ground, Daryl. And just, yeah. Um, let's see. Do you, yeah, you know what? DUI guy's been running a hustle on that grade. I don't blame him. I don't, he harnessed that lightning and is riding it. Good for him. It's just, that's not the kind of lightning I want to ride. Mention Martha Risk in any of the hail streams from anyone and they all go ape shit. Um I mean, isn't that the name of the like she goes by George? It's kind of weird she goes by a dude name, but okay. She like you know what? Maybe maybe we could have a uh, getting back to Daryl Brooks in jail with uh Lorenzo. <laughs> we could have him and Schweikert in there and be like, "Did you titty fuck his butt cheeks?" With your penis? Yes. What did Daryl do? Daryl started screaming a lot. Uh, D 
Do you want guys to make up for the money lost from his chili client? Yeah, I heard chili like they were Larry's charging like what, like 15, 20 G's to represent Chili's guy? Which I don't blame them. Fucking get those idiots to pay all the money they can. G Rex says, in all serious, if you cover Hales, I will find you. Well, you could probably talk to 2.0, so it's not gonna be hard. But if you do find me, you better fucking come heavy or don't come at all. That's 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 a rule for everybody. Everybody. John says I'll watch Daryl, but Johnny Rabbit sells a special place in my heart. <laughs> Aww. Well, thank you for the super chat, but yes, very true. There was a fan in the Hales chat yesterday called, because uh, she called the governor a pussy. Well, I mean, oh no, she flux insulted the governor, the uh, honor of the great jet of the great Ron DeSantis. The horror. <gasps> yeah, Jeff is covering it because of the wacko judge, but I just, I can't. I can't. It's just, there's too much. There's just too much there. I can't cover it. Titty, titty, fook them butt cheeks, pretty much. Luke says, what if you come with pie? I might, I mean, maybe. That might be your... <clears throat> to be fair, that might be your distraction method because if you got pie, I'll be like, "Ooh, pie!" And you know that's when you uh come back. You know, like here you go, Sean. Here's the pie. Bow. That's how you get me. Or the guns in the pie, and you're just like, "Bow." Yes, yeah, send bachelors, many of them. And you better, like I said, you'd uh. Th that's just. It's not going to be easy, I can tell you that much. Um, that's that's all I can. That's. You know, it's very much like. Um. Very much like what General Stark said, you know, there are is this mighty night or my wife sleeps a widow. So, you know, for you guys, keep that in mind. What battle was that on the eve? Oh, what battle? John Stark. What battle was that? Was it the Battle of Bennington? Oh, fuck. I don't know. Uh, yes, it was. It was ben Battle of Bennington, Vermont. Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. But yeah, send many bachelors. Send men without children. Send men with many children, too, if you don't have bachelors. You know Johnny Rapid is. I'm assuming he's a porn star. I don't. I don't. I'm not. I'm not familiar with the male porn stars out there. I don't. I. I that's not. That's not the. Uh, for the limited knowledge of porn stars I have, I never spent that on the men. So. I'm bringing my horses. Oh, what are you, you going to do, Vosh? So. When someone comes at you, you come right back. Me to Sean Martin Ethan Ralph 2024. Yes. Come loaded. Yes. Send flan. Flan. <laughs> hmm. Can Lorenzo get an expedited death since he won't appeal it? That's the thing, though. He has appealed. There is an appeal currently pending. Uh, that, 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 that part has, um, gone on. So his attorneys have appealed. And where is, I had it earlier and I 
had it a while back. I'm trying to find it, see if I still have it. But yes, he has since appealed. And the appeal was written by his attorneys. It's a very nicely done appeal. Uh, let me see. Do I still have it? Well, no, it's got to be somewhere. Nope, I don't have it. Dang it, I thought I did. Oh, well, hold on. There's got to be a... Let me see here. Search of my history. Okay. Mm. Oh, yeah, here we go. I found it. Found it. Found it. Got it, chat. Got it, Seattle. So he filed an appeals brief back in... back in November of last year. So it's going straight to the Florida Supreme Court. Now, that's not uncommon. In Ohio, the same thing. A death penalty case, the appeal is straight to the Supreme Court for review. That's just because that's that's that serious, so they automatically take it. Might even be in their state constitution that they have to do it. So, but you have initial brief, an initial brief of the appellant, um, and the appellant is Lorenzo. So we're going to put up here. If he appeals, then he's a true dom torturing the courts. Yes. Yes, come loaded. Ah. Uh, any Diddy updates? Not that I'm aware of right now, guys. There's not a whole lot to talk about for Diddy. Is it in Gosney's? No, Gosney's not one of the people listed on this. Remember, guys, this is in uh, this is on the other side of the state from Gosney. Gosney's over on the uh, east side of Florida. East side, Steve. I know you're out there. No, Gosney's, and I think he said Delray Beach. Down that way, so he's not. This is not his hood. This is not his hood. Yeah, appearing before the court may have been the long term goal. Oh, hi, Clyde. Hi, Bubba. I got no more treats for you, buddy. I'm sorry. Do you want up here? Do you want up? Hey, hey. Come on. Do you want up? Okay. I guess you won't hang out with me. So. Let's see. Yeah, the feds raided his son's mansion. Well, that was also kind of like Diddy's mansion, though, too. So, these are the... It's the 10th Judicial Circuit, so it's not even Steve's circuit. Um, that That's who he did there. Table of Contents Authorities. The argument's really the big thing here. So, what if the trial court failed or violated his right to a fair trial, um, guaranteed by Sixth Amendment, by allowing him to represent himself despite his lack of understanding of the proceedings? Basically, he's claiming, I was too stupid to understand what's going on. Whether the court abused its discretion to consider the mitigation report composed by um, standby counsel after accepting appellant's waiver of mitigation evidence other than what he presented. Which this one, I understand because it's a death penalty case, you make all the arguments you can. This one seems kind of like goofy that like, well, your honor, he said he was done and you accepted more evidence. That's an abuse of your discretion. So... That those are the two those are the two major arguments they did. So that is what happened there. And as we talked about, guys, this case was back in June of 2016 and 17. Uh, that it's gone on forever. So he has been he has been dealing with this for quite a while. And they talked about the Spencer hearing, and that Spencer hearing was the hearing he had. So I don't think we have that, but the Spencer hearing was held where the appellant did not offer any additional mitigation evidence and additionally stated he wanted the death penalty. So the final sentencing heard on February 24th. Again, he stated his wish for the death penalty. The trial court obliged. So 
he did he did get what he wanted. So there were some things ultimately there were no issues that gave him any reason to not impose the death penalty as far as mitigation is concerned. So we'll, if you guys want to, we can go ahead to those parts and see. So did he allow, did he violate six amendment by allowing himself to be represented despite his lack of understanding? You know, the right to self-representation. I think what case were we talking about recently where this was an issue? Maybe only exercise. I think it was a Daryl Brooks. If you make a competent, knowing, and voluntary waiver of counsel, you have to know what you're doing. You know, that said, though, a defendant's choice to invoke this must be honored out of respect for that right that the individual has. I have the right to choose who I want. But you have to be very, very sure. And they have to do it voluntarily and intelligently, electing to do so. Um, the trial courts can deny unequivocal requests for self-representation. When there's a determination the defendant suffers from a severe mental illness to the point where he's not competent to conduct the trial proceedings by him or herself. And I don't think that's the case. He's definitely competent. He was definitely competent. You know, and the testing for the test for competency is not very hard. It's whether you have a present um, ability to consult with your lawyer to a reasonable degree of rational understanding. And if you can understand the process that's going on, it doesn't take much, guys. So their arguments are going to be that he doesn't have the ability. So, you know, and the competency is to make sure the defendants understand the proceedings and can assist their counsel. Well, he was very, I mean, he wrote a 147 page thing that was well wrote out, that wasn't crazy. I like how you can do a Sabella impression because we both say I'm on a fat in the vocal cords. His fat, my fat's all in my gut. His fat, he does have a fat neck. So I don't have the ability to do what Sabella's doing. Yes, Fifty Shades of Gideon. Yes. So. Oh, Clyde, did you lock yourself in, buddy? Hold on, buddy. I'm going to reach over there and get that for you. Hold on. Hey, I'll to unhook the, the headset. Close the door on himself. It's kind of goofy. Is this not? Is this Corey? Yeah, that's. A, it should be Times New Roman, but I, I don't know why they did that. It's really goofy. So. Um. Now, they do point out that at his argument, as the trial court began to make the inquiry whether or not he knew what was going on, he invoked, he spoke of invoking his rights without prejudice, using the uniform commercial code, and that he has the right to settle this commercial matter any way he wants. And then the court explained to him, this is a criminal case, not civil, and that he understood the risks and limitations. Uh, so, appellant told... an. This is Lorenzo toward the trial. It was a commercial court that he owned the rights. And the trial court determined he was competent to waive counsel. However, when asked if he was going to enter a plea to the charges, he said, back then, he said in 2016, 17, I'm here to settle. I will not plea. There is no reason to plea. The argument is clearly he didn't understand what was going on. Um, he continued to make the same argument throughout the pretrial periods. Um, from September of 2017 to April of 2021. At one point, he claimed there was a lack of jurisdiction. So, um, he does, he talks about the bar. The Bar Association stands under British Acc Accreditation Registry. It falls under British law. It's a private membership. All of you are part of a private membership and have taken up under foreign jurisdiction. I do not accept putting a foreign jurisdiction into an independent right to my own jurisdiction in this defense. You infiltrating into the defense and compromising the defense by doing so. You, you have a conflict of interest and should make these two guys, these two standby attorneys, um, gentlemen, recuse themselves 
Because first of all, you belong to a private club, call it what you want, a private union with the Bar Association. It's a conflict of interest. I don't belong to that union. I do not belong to that club. I don't think you belong to many clubs. Um, secondly, you know, he brings up, along with the state attorney, you all get paid by the same source. Well, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, yes, they get paid by the state. So that's collusion in and of itself. Not really, but somebody has to pay them. You know, he talks about trying to control the defense by going in the back door. Well, he, he knows all about that. You know, enforcing your jurisdiction on me. He sounds 100% like a sob sit, doesn't he, guys? I stand in a private jurisdiction. I stand in my own jurisdiction. You're forcing me to stand under your court, and I will not stand under your court. You're forcing a harm, an injury against my success state. Well, when they give you the death penalty, it's really going to be harming your success state. And actually, it'd be like successor state, but a state, but okay. They're, what they're doing is committing commercial slander and fraud against the trust. Oh, craziness. So they bring up, you know, they bring up, he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. He sounds like a loon. I mean, if he had his way, he would like to go back through the trial again. Yes, he's based. <laughs> yeah, Luke says, oh, buddy, did you lock yourself in? Is that what, is what Lorenzo said to Black Holtz? Yeah. Hella says, that's not Courier New. You guys are trying to find the font. Oh. So... It's probably just MS Serif. There's nothing tricky here. Yeah, the other thing is, for some reason, there's prosecutor's offices and places, including some public defenders, they use Word Perfect, and I don't fucking understand why. Word Perfect is garbage. On all of his pleadings, he signed his name as a secured party, or secured party and holder in due course and sole beneficiary to the Stephen Lorenzo Trust. Uh, with the penalty phase, he showed a lack of understanding the proceedings. Um, at the pretrial, the state announced it would continue to seek death penalty. Um, the appellant announced he was withdrawing his offer. Um, so he further stated, because as far as I'm concerned, the defense is giving up too many comforts and what do you call it, benefits by the state withdrawing the death penalty. So we don't want to withdraw the death penalty. I made that clear in mitigation. So these statements clearly do not make sense and clearly show he did not understand. Well, I don't think it's really going to get far. Um, then he filed a motion called the Defense Mitigation Rejection Notice. That's that thing we read, which stated his desire for the death penalty, but then it shows his anguish at the state's rejection of his offer to plead no contest about charges of capital murder in exchange for a life sentence. At paragraph D of the part labeled Detailed Feedback, that might be the part we couldn't get to. The appellant stated the defendant actually preferred the death penalty claim remain on the table. And then he says he characterized the offer as the state's counteroffer to lift the death penalty in exchange for more information about other victims. Remember, we talked about it. He does have other victims, it sounds like. In the final notice section of the motion, he warns that by rejecting to choose the life, um, life sentence over the death sentence, the prosecutors have put their souls and spiritual harm which must be paid in kind. Oh. So, yeah, they're, they're making, they're basically pointing out the defense attorney. They're like, wow, he's crazy. We can't listen to him at all. So, I don't think this is really going to go anywhere at the end of the day. But it's an argument that has to be made. So, so that is, uh, yeah, that's it, guys. We're all caught up. We're all caught up. I believe it's not word perfect anymore. I think so. Yes, yeah, so there was a there was an estate case, a probate case, where the the one attorney noticed that the font was different. Yes, 
There's a website called Typography Lawyers. Hmm, that's interesting. So, just ship him over to Guatemala. Well, no, then he's in. He's not far enough away. He could still cross the border. So. Corelli used to have that too, yeah. So. I can't stand it. I could not stand word perfect. All right, guys, that is it for tonight. Tomorrow night, we are going to be getting into the George Kelly trial. George Kelly is the rancher out in... Arizona, who's accused of murder because he shot at a group of armed uh, migrants crossing the border, illegal aliens crossing the border, and one of them died, so he's being charged with murder, and his trial is currently ongoing. So we're going to start that, and we're going to catch up with that. Um, so that is that is the standard game plan, guys. If you weren't here last night, we laid out the game plan. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we're going to be starting at 8, covering stuff. Thursday, still at 9.30. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because it's the weekend, we're going to be playing that by ear probably a lot more, especially as we get to the summer. And then Monday nights, we are going to be doing locals. Uh, we're going to be doing the Monday night show at 8 for now. And if locals gets its chat fixed up, which it looks like it might from what I've heard from locals, we might just going back to locals. Um, I'm going to have to figure out what to do for you guys over here on uh, – YouTube for the members, but I do want to give you guys your own thing, so. Yeah. Um, if you're caught up, show the Richard Allen fundraiser. Um, uh, oh, yes, that actually will be a good thing. So, guys, Richard Allen, the guy charged, the guy being accused of the Delphi murders, um, has... Um, been denied has been denied the ability to have a turn experts put together. <clears throat> Judge Gold's denied it. She's also prevented the attorneys from getting paid. I mean, she's doing everything she can to fuck this case up. So what has happened in the meantime is that people have put together a website fundraising to try to get some money together for some attorneys. What I will tell you guys is go ahead and do it, but I'm not sure, you know, I don't know how much they're going to need because they had a bunch of attorneys they wanted to get together. And we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Um, where is it? Come on. I just had it. Yeah, here we go. This is the actual website. Um, he's actually looking... Oh, they're making good progress on this. Holy cow. Um, you guys can go here and donate if you want to. Um, oh, don't watch the reopenings with you. They took an entire fucking day. Well, we'll skip through them if they're there, and we'll just get into the actual arguments because I don't necessarily need the... Uh, don't need the openings. But we'll take a look at them. Maybe we'll skip ahead. But yes, this is for Richard Allen. The experts for Richard Allen. And this has been verified. This is a true, legit place. Pay it to. Um, his attorneys are kind of boomers, so they set this up. The Hennessy Law Office set it up. Remember, Hennessy's the attorney that was representing um, Rosie and Bradley for their stuff. So 235 people have donated nearly $13,000 on a goal of 25000 so if you guys can and you're wanting to help out Richard Allen just a bit, throw in a couple bucks. You know, certainly would help. So um, Jail saying, was he the rancher? Yeah, he's the landowner. It's his land. Yep, their goal is 25K and they're almost there. They're halfway there now. So they're making good progress. So that is why we're doing this. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Judge Gold does in the meantime as far as destroying this man's constitutional rights. But 
you know, time will tell. And we are going to be doing a review of Richard Allen on, uh, we'll be doing that Friday night because there's just so much to cover. There's so much to cover now. The state is full of complete fucking scumbags. We're n- we, we've assuredly learned that now. So with that said, guys, I'm going to leave this up so you can see it. And I'll put the uh, actual address in chat. Yes, that is 100% the Delphi guy, Mayo. That is 100% him. So here is the... Here is the plea. Or I'm sorry, no, here's the plea. Here is the website. If you go, you want to donate to him, you could definitely do it. I know he would be appreciative of anything you guys could put together. So that is it for us tonight. We are going to just uh, kind of play ourselves out and have a great night. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Like I said, we have George Kelly's trial to start. It sounds like the openings are bad, so we'll skip them if we have to and get right into it. And then Thursday, uh, there's quite a bit to talk about. Even more new updates for uh, President Trump. So, good night, guys. I will talk to you later. Bye. Whatever you do, just don't talk to cops. Even when they nab you on illegal stops. Just because you did it doesn't mean you're guilty. But please talk to a local attorney. Was that the fact? Yelled at 